Can you hear Tourism Cowichan? Cameras live. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Regional Services Committee for July 22nd, 2020. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. And with that, we will move on to adoption of approval of the agenda. I would like to move UB1 up after the second delegation after D2. So move unfinished business up to D2. And is there any other additions or changes I can see? There is none. All right, so we will look, I'm looking for an approval of the agenda, please. So moved and seconded, all in favor? Opposed, if any, motions carried. And the adoption of the minutes of June 24th. Moved, second, any questions? All in favor? Opposed, if any? Thank you very much. Carrying on now, is there any business arising from the minutes, Ms. Legault? None from staff. Okay, and we'll move now to public input period. Thank you, Ms. Legault. Thank you, Madam Chair. The first submission for public input period is from Diane Allen, and it reads, the Couch and Housing Association is the stewards for affordable housing, and as such, expectations would be that the CBRD would receive documents that reflect what was promoted by the CBRD and voted on by taxpayers. Trial balance covers many expenditures, some that perhaps supported are supported by other funds coming from federal or provincial. Oddly, no mention of any CBRD administration charge, which was $15,000. I haven't found the actual amount, but this is from my recollection. It appears the board must have approved to waive this. CHA General Ledger report to our CBRD board should clearly reflect the mandate that taxpayers agreed to in the referendum. According to the CBRD website, this financial contribution service is generally allocated as follows. $500,000 or 65% would be committed directly to seed funding for getting bricks and mortar projects underway and would be known as the Housing Trust Fund. The target users of these projects would be low to moderate income households including families with children, lone parent families, singles and seniors. 138,000 or 18% would be dedicated to ensuring housing projects succeed through comprehensive project assessments, up-to-date data collected to justify need and demand, developing new partnerships and preventing housing loss for our most vulnerable residents. Several expenses in the CHA ledger do not reflect the mandate given by the CBRD to constituents. As a taxpayer, I'm expecting that the board will investigate why we're paying for laundry, buying tents, and expensive security services, uh, $34,177 plus $1,890. So I suspect that little has been spent on ensuring future housing projects, which was the mandate we voted on. And thirdly, the 127,000 or 17% would be used for overhead costs required to administer the service, including CBRD administration costs. And that is from Diane Allen. The second submission is from Donna Einerson of Cobble Hill. I'd like to commend John Horn and his staff for their work during the past year. I'm concerned that the financial statements show that once the COVID-19 efforts started in May, there doesn't seem to be any emergency housing payments or funds expended to individuals. The last emergency funding to help a family seems to be on February 25th. This is in contrast to the approximately 34 assisted payments during the previous eight months. I'm wondering how vulnerable people managed to stay in their accommodation during the past four months without the help for one third of the year. Perhaps Mr. Horn will have an explanation during his presentation. That is signed Donna Einerson. The third submission is from Brenda Dawn of Cobble Hill to CBRD. It is reassuring to CBRD residents that John Horn and his staff have been successful in providing affordable housing as promised by CBRD prior to the 2018 referendum. During the various open house public consultations, videos, and social media events, CBRD promoted the concept of necessity of skin in the game, or $5 to $1 leverage, which would allow Couch and Housing Association to receive grant funding from senior levels of government to assist in building badly needed housing, such as the new housing units approved for Ladysmith. There remains a critical lack of housing across CBRD as well as the South End, which needs to be addressed by Couch and Housing Association. As per the recently provided financial documents of Couch and Housing, $391,640 was used as skin in the game for Lady Smith Project as it was intended. However, also disclosed in the financial statements was a variety of expenditures unrelatable to the affordable housing promise. Uh, CBRD representatives have 
stated funds from one function cannot be transferred to another, yet CHA's financial documents, it appears funds intended for housing projects is being diverted to social planning projects with items being financially reimbursed from Calgon housing funds. If $391,640 can be leveraged to build an apartment complex, what is the justification of spending approximately $107,000 for cleaning security tents and towels? As dire as the COVID-19 situation may be, I'm appealing to CBRD directors to provide oversight of Function 498. Signed, Brenda Kwan. The fourth submission is from Cliff Evans from Shawnigan Lake. Madam Chair, on this morning's agenda is R1, Report from Environmental Services Division, the Regional Surface Water Quality Monitoring and Strategy. It is nice to see the very lengthy and thorough report finally finished. There was a lot of historic data, but also some recent statistics too. I was very interested in the surface water monitoring strategy for the Cowichan Valley Regional Dis District, especially the next steps and recommendations. One, consultation with stakeholders to confirm sites for long-term monitoring. Two, stakeholders should also have the opportunity to evaluate additional candidate sites. Three, identification of community volunteer organizations. Four, training volunteers in water sampling protocol. Five, implementation of surface water collection program. The Shawnigan Basin Society is now set up and can be one of these volunteer organizations as we have been performing most of these tasks for years. Thank you, and this is signed Cliff Evans. The fifth and final submission is from Bernard Yearling. Dear Chair, it is good to see that the Drinking Water and Watershed Protection Function has commissioned a number of reports on surface water within the CBRD. The unfortunate thing is that staff do not consider the goals of this function as well as the goals of the cli CBRD Climate Change Adaptation Framework when making recommendations. The first objective listed in the framework is steward, protect, and restore Cowichan re region ecosystems and biodiversity in an era of climate change and continued population growth. Yet staff recommended the approval of five soil deposit permits where at least three of the proposed sites will increase nutrient carrying sediments in Van Horn Creek, Upper Shawnigan Creek, and thus ultimately into Shawnigan Lake, thereby increasing algae blooms and promoting the growth of Eurasian, Eurasian water milfoil in the lake. Because of time constraints, I've only read the development of water quality targets for Mill Bay and tributaries to Mill Bay. This is an excellent report, however, there are a few small errors. One, Handyson Creek does not empty directly into the Saanich Inlet. It joins with Hollings Creek before emptying into Lower Shawnigan Creek and not directly into the inlet. Two, the Mill Bay and District Conservation Society has been moving coho salmon into Lower Shawnigan Creek since 1978, not the 2004 date mentioned in the report. What is missing from these reports is a strategy to attain water quality targets. It seems that we are endlessly studying issues and not developing specific strategies to resolve issues such as loss of cover of streams, the numerous landfill, landfill sites polluting streams and lakes with nutrient laden sediment and forestry practices that increase sediment load of streams and lakes and decrease water carrying capacity of forest floors, thereby decreasing replenishment capacity of our aquifers, as well as farming practices that increase nutrient levels of streams and lakes. When developing strategies, the CBRD should also take into account the 2015 Herb Hammond Report entitled Ecosystem-Based Conservation Plan for Shawnigan Lake Watershed, commissioned by the Shawnigan Basin Society. The more recent report, still in draft form, entitled Ecosystem-Based Assessment to the Coxsila River Watershed by Emily Doyle Yamaguchi and Heather Pritchard, that was supported in part by the Shawnigan Basin Society, will also be a useful resource. And that is signed Bernard Yearling of Mill Bay, BC. And that concludes public input period. Uh, Madam Chair, I wonder if I could just interlay. Um, I have another um, email here um, from Bernard Yearling, which was also intended for public input, um, and I'm surprised it's not been read out. Uh, um, he was he was just on there. He has two. Yeah. I don't. I'm I'm not sure how the time went, so I didn't. I wasn't timing it. So, Ms. Legault. Madam Chair, I believe the second submission is for the board meeting this afternoon. Oh, my okay. mistake. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, once again, welcome uh, to the Couch and Housing Association. Go ahead, please. And you have a presentation. Do you have? Yes. Uh, okay. Thanks. So yes. you'll switch screens. Yes, I will. Thank I you so much. A, I do have a PowerPoint presentation. I, um, I'll turn that on in a moment or so. You can all hear me, I hope. Yes, yeah. I good. can. Excellent. So um, I thought I'd start out by um, 
introducing my board chair who is with us here today, uh, Joy Hayden, and myself and the board uh, of directors want to thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you and bring you an update on the Tower of Chicago and all our Welcome, Welcome Joy. So we appreciate the time, and uh, in a moment or two, I'll bring up the PowerPoint slide, and let's hope all the technical aspects of that work, you know, <laughs> and then we'll run through that. But I just wanted to preface, uh, I heard the questions that were asked, and I thought I'd just touch on a couple of items. Um, you may recall the last time we came to speak to you was February the 26th, and we updated you at that point on our activities, and we brought you the budgets and what things we've done. So today I wanted to speak about the time frame between February 26th and today. So to take a look back at what activities we've undertaken and then to look forward to March 31st, which is the end of our fiscal year. Let's talk about what will be happening over the next six months or so. So that'll be the frame that the um, PowerPoint speaks to is the time between our last presentation and now and looking forward. And then I thought I'd just mention that um, the course February 26th was the last time we spoke, but. Uh, there has been quite a significant event that's happened in the meantime, and that, of course, is the coronavirus epidemic. So so John, can I just excuse me for a sec? I hear a little bit of a whistling, but I see the CDRD IT. Their microphone is not on mute. I'm wondering if that's... I'm getting a little bit of a background squeal. I'm not sure if that's it. No? So I see CVRD. There's somebody, CVRD IT, with the microphone on. Is it to be left on? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, John. Sorry for my interruption. No worries. We'll have to live with the squeal, I guess. <laughs> so uh, I think what I wanted to mention was that, of course, when we last spoke, the COVID epidemic was very much in its infancy, and uh, the impact on everyone in the world, and particularly on people here in the Cowichan Valley, has been significant. For Cowichan Housing Association, um, that impact has been quite large as well. We've been part of the coronavirus task force that looked at the vulnerable population in our community and have played a big role in that. Um, some of the questions that were asked reference that very bunch of activity. And I would say that uh, with our partners on the coalition on the task force, we have leveraged close to half a million dollars into the Cowichan Valley to address the vulnerable population and to keep us and them safe during this time. We think that's a significant achievement. What you will see in our financial statements is that we, as the nonprofit entity, because we have a strong relationship with BC Housing, we agreed to be the funnel through for much of the funding that's come to our community for those activities. So we've received almost all the money that BC Housing has spent in our community has come through us. We also have additional money from foundations, and as I say, we're close to half a million dollars that have come in in the last four months. Uh, we thank the Victoria Foundation and the Jowell Foundation, by the way, for their contributions. But when you look at our financial statements and you see us buying tents and water and paying various people for various things, those are the flow through dollars from the provincial government of BC Housing to create these emergency response centers. And if you drive through our community or in any parts of our community, you'll see the tenting sites that we've set up in Ladysmith, at Fuller Lake, and in the downtown area of the city center of Duncan, et cetera. Those are the emergency response centers we set up for the vulnerable population. Currently, we're housing approximately 90 people under those circumstances, and um, it's going well so far. But in my slideshow presentation, I'll speak a little bit more to that. I just did want to address that issue on the financial statements to say that all those small items that look like they have nothing to do with affordable housing are flow through dollars that we've received from BC Housing to uh, implement these emergency response during this COVID time. So again, I'll touch a bit more on that. The other thing I wanted to say was that um, this organization has pulled on a number of contractors during this time to implement the emergency response centers, cleaning crews, security guards. There's a lot of contracts we're undergoing. Essentially, the organization is still the one and a half person show that it started out as. It's myself as executive director, who's the only full-time staff, and Morgan Chattington, our admin person, who works three days a week. So that's the layout for our staff, and it's myself and admin assistant in that step. We do have a number of contractors for COVID, but I'll come back to the why I've mentioned that staff in case a little later in the PowerPoint presentation. So maybe what I'll do then is uh, move to the PowerPoint and then 
uh, when I've completed that, I'll come back on screen and we can take any further questions. And hopefully, uh, the PowerPoint uh, will have addressed those questions that were raised by the um, by residents. So, so give me just a second. I'll bring that up, and we'll hopefully this all goes well. Thank you. I just I'm, I'm having um, still that squealing sound. Is anybody else hearing that sound? Okay. I just um, wanted to double check. Okay. Now it's good. All right, so I'm assuming that everyone can see the front page of that PowerPoint slide. Yes, we can. And now I'm just going to see how I change slides, <laughs> which is the $64,000 question. Aha, uh -huh. I have found out. Very good. So thank you for again for having me. And you'll see there that's just our new logo. I hope you like that. That's a very small piece, but we did do a little bit of a refresh on our look, and that's it. So. I want to speak first to the Housing Trust Fund. And I would also note, by the way, that there was a question regarding the CBRD's administration fee that they retain as a part of the Regional Housing Service. And I would note that that is say, held back by the CBRD and the allocation of both us and the Housing Trust Fund is net of that administrative fee. So that's withheld at source by the CBRD, just to answer that question by the, by the one, um, one of the residents. So the Housing Trust Fund, uh, the backwards look is just to March 1st, to today, June 30th, and then looking ahead to the to March 31st, which is the end of our fiscal frame. So in the Housing Trust Fund, you'll see we'll have a rental housing capital contribution that was referenced by one of the questioners. And you'll see that we provided $317,000 to the Ladysmith Resource Center Association project. That's going to be 36 units of housing on Bullard Street in Ladysmith. That project is moving ahead. They've received, um, I think they're at the building permit issuance stage, and Aaron Stone could probably uh, correct me on that, but they are proceeding on that development, and that will be 36 units of housing. We hope to see groundbreaking this calendar year, and again, Aaron could speak more specifically probably to the process right now for the issuance of permits, et cetera. That'll be a range of folks living in there from uh, individuals with disabilities to seniors to families. So it's a cross section of the community that will be housed there. And that'll be an affordable housing project. And in my view of the building plans, it looks like a very attractive uh, building. I think it'll be a great amenity for the ladies. The second piece is the governance structures we created, the Housing um, Trust Allocations Committee and the Community Advisory Committee. The, uh, the trust. Uh, uh, the Allocations Committee, of course, has reviewed three uh, requests for funding, the Lady Smith proposal, plus two project development assistance funding requests. That you'll see below, it's $25,000 was granted to the folks who operate Duncan Manor, and that's the Duncan Housing Society. That is for them to look at the replacement of their existing building. They currently house 122 people in their current building, but it is an aging building uh, it wasn't built uh, brilliantly in the first place. Um, the repair costs are outweighing the lifespan of the building to the point where the both, both BC Housing and the society um, are contemplating a redevelopment uh, because it actually makes more economic sense at this point to redevelop than it does to continue pouring money to an aging facility. So that's an ongoing discussion. We've provided money for Duncan Manor to investigate what options they have in terms of redevelopment. and. Uh, We'll be bringing something before the CBRD or North Cowichan and boards to, to look at what that's going to look like. Uh, we have to find another site, et cetera, et cetera. But they're busy investigating options to replace the building. The good news on that one is the discussions with our provincial partners, BC Housing. They've indicated that they're not wanting to merely replace the 122 units that are existing now in Duncan Manor, but they actually want to double that number and do a build around the 250 units scale. So that way they add 125 units to our um, existing. So that's the good news. We'll see if we can pull that into fruition, but the $25,000 sets Duncan Manor on the path of getting that to, to reality. The second allocation is to Cowichan Lake. Uh, that's the Elder Care Society. They've been working with the town of Lake Cowichan for some time and have a site identified that they're gonna make available for that purpose. So the money that we've given them is allowing them to do surveys, which will allow them to do massing studies and various bits and pieces. So they can then proceed to make an application to BC Housing. They anticipate having an application into BC Housing prior to the December cutoff for this current round of funding. So we hope and anticipate that 
Lake Cowichan will receive a project at the end of the funding cycle. So the $25,000 we provided will allow them to do the preliminary work that gets them there. So that's the, um, the housing trust fund. We've had some rental capital contributions. We've reviewed some allocations. We've given some project assistance out. And total, I guess, that's about $367,000 that's been allocated. And that's from the housing trust fund. So the next piece is, of course, um, we will look forward. This is a looking forward piece. In the coming frame, up till March 31st of next year, we anticipate seeing a request for rental con contribution for rental capital. And that's likely to come from the two societies who were funded through the project development funding. So we hope we will see an application coming forward from Duncan Manor to make a contribution to a rental housing project. And we hope to see an application coming forward from Lake Cowichan folks for a contribution to their rental housing project in Lake Cowichan. Both of those, of course, are affordable housing projects. In Lake Cowichan is a bit more seniors oriented, and Duncan is a little more oriented to disabilities. So those are the key uh, pieces we see coming forward in the next six months around rental housing capital contributions. And we hope to bring those forward to the CBRD board for their approval uh, or the review and recommendation. Uh, sometime in this calendar year. We see also with the governance structures that we've created, we have the allocations committee, which is still active, and we review applications as they come forward. The community advisory committee we created, one of the things that they decided to do when we last met was to have a series of public education workshops and seminars where we would bring in experts from around uh, who would talk to things like tiny home developments or new uh, ways of managing affordable housing projects. We felt that it was a good opportunity to provide lots of both education and information to the community about housing, and then a way to receive input on housing projects as well. Unfortunately, what happened was with the COVID situation, the idea of gathering groups of people uh, to consult and to provide education, to have workshops, seemed to be off the table because of the constraints on physical gathering. So we do have to rethink how we might do that, and I've had some conversations in the last couple of days with members of the Community Advisory Committee. So we'll reconvene by Zoom and rethink what it is that that committee wants. So that's just a note that uh, we had a plan for that committee, a series of public education events, and uh, we just sort of put that on hold due to the pandemic situation. It's the Emergency Contingency Fund, which is a component of the Housing Trust Fund, that's a $10,000 allocation. Uh, we're working still on the criteria and the process procedures for allocating that money. Um, Who is that going to be for? Under what circumstances? How is it handed out? It's fairly complicated in terms of making sure that it's available to people who are in an emergency and yet in a way that's manageable for everybody. So that will be something we're bringing forward again to the CBRD board, a series of procedures and recommendations about how that fund is allocated. So that's the last component of the housing trust fund. With the project development assistance, um, we're anticipating further uh, requests for project development assistance coming forward in the next couple of months. We also want an existing um, PDF recipients. We work closely with them to find out how are things going with the money they're spending, um, providing them with the accountability and us with the accountability around those expenditures. So we anticipate that the two projects that are receiving funding now they report back to us regularly on what they've spent the money on, what were the outcomes of those expenditures, and then we, we continue to work with them as they roll through those dollars. Um, we anticipate that there'll be new applications coming forward for project development assistance. We're working with a number of groups around initial stages, what kind of vision do they have for housing, uh, do, if they have a site, what are the constraints on that site, what might we do on that. So we're working with a lot of small groups, be it nonprofit societies, some faith communities, for example, some what you call fraternal organizations like legions, et cetera. With those groups, uh, there's often a fair amount of gestation that happens before they come forward to the point where they're spending money on surveyors or technical requirements. We want to make sure that when they spend their PDF funding that they're doing it to advance a project and not just to kind of get a sense of what they want to do. So we'll support them in that area, helping them define and clarify their vision and then hopefully um, supporting their capacity to the point where they come and ask us for project development assistance. And 
they'll do so in respect of a specific project on a specific site. And that'll lead hopefully to an affordable housing project not too long after. So that's where we stand with the project development assistance. And we're supporting a number of groups. We hope to see a number of applications coming forward in the next six months. So um, one of the things looking forward is that um, we have a housing research and information hub that we've talked to you about in the past. I just wanted to touch very briefly on that. We have hired uh, um, and retained a partnership with VIU. We have Dr. Michael Lake, and he's with the um, uh, sociology department at VIU. He's received a grant from CMHC. Um, he's hired Andrew Wilson, uh, you see there, as his research assistant. He's now in our office four days a week, and he's working with us on a number of issues to move forward the housing research and information hub. So one of the things we'll do is look at affordable housing best practices local government. We've been speaking with uh, staff in North Cowichan and working with elected officials and talking about what are the policies that might be adopted by local government that will enhance our ability to develop and provide affordable housing in the Valley. So there's a, a, a number of policies and it gets very complicated as you can imagine, but we are working to provide um, an inspirational list of here's the best policy practices from around North America and looking at what we might adopt in the Cowichan Valley level to support the development of affordable housing and as well industry best practices around building and managing. So we have also um, uh, an idea that those people who are interested in putting up affordable housing be it church groups or nonprofit entities often are uh, looking for a bit of inspiration around what is that going to look like. So we want to have a visual case file of examples, great examples of, of projects that have been built in our jurisdiction. So we look here at one that's been done down in Victoria, and you'll see that's the budget there and who it's operated by and who it houses. You'll see a second one, which I'm really proud of. That's one of my projects from Nanaimo. That's called Upton's Walk, and that's a supportive housing project for formerly homeless individuals, and that's in the north end of Nanaimo. So what we want to do is create a really a rich uh, body of examples of types of housing, both form and character, but also who lives there and who runs it and how it's operated. We'll also look at um, a development of a really strong socioeconomic profile of our community. So if you're a developer of affordable housing or a developer of for-profit housing, you can take a look at who lives in the community I want to build in, what is the profile of that community, and who lives there and how old, and what money do they make, et cetera, et cetera, so that there's a rich mine of information about who's going to be your neighbors and who you're potentially going to be housing in your building. We're looking at project funding and financing links for interested parties to go and see what CMHC offers, what BC Housing offers, what our partners at Brown City offer. So that would be an easy way to go on our website and find out who provides money for this and, and what are the constraints and what are the conditions they provide those on. Lastly, of course, um, we want to provide a short snapshot of the OCP and zoning bylaws that are relevant for this topic. They can be quite hefty documents for citizens to wade through to find that little piece of information. So we want to provide a bit more of a focused look at if you're interested in developing affordable housing, what are the relevant aspects of the OCP? What are the relevant zoning bylaws that you need to pay attention to? And that way it sort of shortens the journey of figuring that stuff out if you're an applicant or an interested party. So. That's just a touch on the housing research and information hub. And again, Andrew's working very away at that as we speak, and we hope to bring that forward for your uh, for your viewing very shortly. So uh, this is where we get to the next biggest piece that we're doing, and uh, and I wanted to just touch a little more on this. So as I mentioned, uh, we were on the journey to working on affordable housing, and along came this pandemic. We became involved as a member of the community and as a statutory as an agency and delivering some of the services and responses for that. And we started that on May 19th. Um, so that's been keeping us quite busy, as you can imagine. So we just want to touch a little bit on that. So we've been working with our partners in the community, and that's all the community agencies in the Cowichan Valley, and then indeed right throughout the CVRD, um, working with our partners at BC Housing and, and to provide these emergency response centers throughout the CVRD. We've leveraged $490,000 to date from the provincial government. And um, actually, that number is $220,000 from the Victoria Foundation. And currently, we're managing 107 people in a variety of sites who were 
formerly homeless on the streets of both Ladysmith, um, Shemanus, and in the, in the Duncan area. So we think that's a really um, fabulous outcome. I like to think of this as affordable housing, albeit quite humble and relatively temporary. But we are housing a number of people who, prior to the COVID pandemic, were literally sleeping in the woods and in the marsh and on the streets of our city. So we think that that even though that's a it's been a very heavy workload for us to manage this function, we think it's a, a legitimate thing to do, and, a, and the outcome's been very good in terms of those folks are now living indoors in regular in a regular stable place. You know, so that's um, uh, a, 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 an ongoing piece we're negotiating with DC Housing to continue the funding for that. They have agreed to extend the current um, emergency response center funding, they call it, to September 30th. That allows us to retain the hotel that we've rented, um, the tenting sites that we see throughout our community, and to maintain those folks in that stable place until September 30th. The transition between September 30th and what happens next is partially related to the development of the supportive housing projects that DC Housing has agreed to provide to this community. And we need to find a way to transition folks from the place we have them now, where they're stable, well-fed, well-rested, and in a, in, a, in a secure, safe environment, and transition those folks into the supported housing projects that are coming down the stream. So we still need to work on that. There's a gap between September 30th and when those supported housing projects are going to come on stream. And we hope to be able to assist those supported housing projects in being successful by providing them with potential tenants who are stable, pure, um, and in a good place to move into a community and to be good neighbors and good residents. So that's our goal is to support those who've been successful and we'll look at how our COVID response links into that so that the two merge. Um, that's really the COVID emergency response plan. And again, if there's any questions specific to our expenditures related to that, again, in our financial statements, you'll see a lot of money that's been flying around to various parties. A lot of our partners in the community have been fabulous with us. They've gone out and purchased items using their own funding, and then we reimburse them from DC Housing Dollars. So it's an all hands on deck effort, and everyone's gone to the max to really make this successful and do what they need to do to make this work. It's a bit of an emergency. It's kind of an emergency scramble kind of situation. So um, we will sort of uh, rearrange those accounting statements so that's more clear, but there is a lot of activity related to that in our general ledger you'll see. So, and again, that's all provincial money from DC Housing and some dollars from foundations and from Federation of Canadian Municipalities, et cetera. So now I'll come back to the um, Regional Housing Service and our function there, and I'll just talk about the two aspects we fund us to do. That's the $250,000 that Calgary Housing receives every year. And we'll talk the, that some of the money is there for strategic planning, capacity building, outreach, et cetera. Those are the pieces that speak to our work with the nonprofit agencies, with the churches, with the fraternal organizations, with little community groups that want to build affordable housing. So that's the work we do and that you've asked us to do to ensure that entities in the Cowichan region who want to put up affordable housing but don't have the capacity to do so are supported. And that's what we John, do. I need to interrupt you for a second. The 10 minutes um, for the delegation is up. I'm going to ask the committee if, if um, we could uh, afford more time for this presentation. Is everyone, everyone willing? I can't take the screen down. As, um, did you take the screen for a second, John? I'll just check with the committee if that's okay. Move that it be extended. Okay, moved and seconded. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Okay, go ahead, John. <laughs> Thank you. I'll try to be less verbose. <laughs> no, that's okay. You have, you have extra time now. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so we are working with uh, others in the region, um, nonprofit entities, et cetera, churches, to really move forward their files around affordable housing to find sites is often a key question for them and working with them on those. So we hope to see that a number of those will be coming forward for project development assistance over the next little while. We all know that developing a, a, a multi-unit building is not a fast process. It takes years in many cases. And so when you're starting from a place of no land, no money, it actually takes quite a while to get to that place. So just recognizing that, that some of these uh, entities are at that place where they have a dream, but they have no capital and no land. And so it does take a while to get to the place where they're applying for funding. 
So just to recognize that. Um, the other piece we're working on is enhancing the collaboration and the coordination throughout the community. You'll see that reflected in our, for example, the task force we created for the coronavirus response, but also in the coalition, the homeless coalitions and other bodies where we sure we make sure that we're collaborating, coordinating with everybody who has a stake in affordable housing in the Cowichan region. Um, obviously, the other thing we do is we go to bat for societies who want funding from our provincial and federal partners, and we are going to advocate for that. We think we've been successful in that. We have BC Housing at the table on a number of projects in this community, and, they're, and they know and they want to invest in the Cowichan Valley. And I think our advocacy has been strong in terms of the Cowichan region. Our voice is elevated that our place in BC Housing's considerations, and we hope to see more money landing in our community as a result of that. Um, the second is that um, we're looking at our attainable housing strategy, which we launched last year. We continue to update that and review that as circumstances change. We're looking to develop our internal capacity to have the maximum impact, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And I'll also look at how our partnerships are going. We have a fabulous partnership with BC Housing in terms of supporting them to help our societies develop housing with CMHC, with Van City, and our other partners. Um, we really want to maximize the investment in college and down. I think we're on our way to seeing a lot more money coming to this community than has been the case in the past. Um, in terms of our uh, management and administration, our our uh, commitment to the funders, uh, which is the CDRD, and through to them, the taxpayers of the region, is that we want to have our processes have integrity, that we're accountable for our dollars that we spend, that we have uh, um, um, transparent and open processes that everyone can see what we do and how we do it. And so what we um, want to convey to everybody is that when we put out our information, we're welcome and, and, and happy to respond to any queries that arise from that. Secondly, we want to look at the projects that we fund, that we want to support them and make sure that they are uh, performing as they uh, said they would when they asked for money and supporting them in, in achieving their goals. And so we do that monitoring of performance piece so that that's the housing trust money. Really, it comes from the CDRD um, through us to the applicants. So our job is to support them in being successful in achieving the goals they identified when they came and asked you for the money in the first place. Uh, we do support the committees that our governance structures, our um, allocations committee and the community advisory committee. And lastly, um, we work with our partners to do community involvement, things like addressing homelessness, to um, identify partnership opportunities, to look at donor recruitment, uh, input to OCP and neighborhood area plans, et cetera, so that and I work with the community that's um, more broad than the particular projects, but yet yields the ground upon which projects arise. So that's something we, we also pay attention to. Um, with the Regional Housing Service, um, we want to say that we have an operating uh, budget that speaks to our operating programs. And one of the things I would say is that when I came into the role, which was in April of last year of Executive Director, there was sufficient funding provided by the CBRD to hire an additional person. So. Again, the um, staffing in the CHA is myself as executive director of full-time role, and Morgan Saddington, our admin person who works three days a week. That's a very lean staff, that's 1.5%, uh, 1.5 FTEs. Um, even though there was dollars available to bring in additional staff to enhance our capacity, what the board and I decided that was really imperative is we spent some time thinking about what is Cowichan Housing Association's role in the provision of affordable housing in the Cowichan region? We obviously have a mandate to facilitate others, uh, social agencies, nonprofits, churches, et cetera, to help them create affordable housing that they would own, operate, and manage. Our discussions were things like, well, does Cowichan Housing Association have a role in building and developing and managing and operating housing? Uh, does Couch and Housing Association have a role in terms of tenant placement in buildings? Do we have a role? So all the questions about what it is we do as an entity to best support the provision of affordable housing in the community, those are questions that I felt we needed to answer before we could bring staff on board. I didn't want to hire anybody for the sake of hiring. I don't believe that we have, we're, we, we're a fiscally prudent place. We want to spend our money wisely. We want to spend it strategically. So we've spent the last year 
as a board and as an entity, thinking about who we are and what role we play in the community. As that's becoming clearer, we're now able to look at bringing people into our organization that are gonna help us do the work that we need to do to create affordable housing in the Valley. Andrew Wilson, an example, is a good example of that. We brought him in to help us do the database and that research and information hub. But I would say that we're now ready to contemplate bringing people into the organization so that we can do the things that are gonna really create affordable housing in the Valley. As such, what you'll see is that we've underspent in that initial allocation you gave us in 2019. About $90,000, between nineteen dollars and $100,000 underspent. That money sits in our account at the moment. And what I would say to you is that right now we're experiencing this pandemic. Right? And one of the issues that we're gonna be facing when this is all over is that the people who are deeply affected economically by, by this, right now there's a fair amount of government support for that. And one of the uh, questions spoke to um, why are we not providing emergency assistance dollars at this moment? Because there's been a ban on eviction. And our emergency assistance dollars are based on the receipt of a eviction notice from a landlord. So people are getting served payments, etc. What we're going to see happening when all that ends is we might have a big uh, ripple effect, in that sense, on the renters in our community. Some of them may find themselves without employment income all of a sudden because their jobs disappeared as a result of the pandemic. We don't know, and I don't think anyone really knows, what this is gonna look like when it ends. When government support ends, when everyone goes back to the regular course of business, who's gonna be affected economically? And the vulnerable renters in our community, I think are gonna be the ones who feel that the most. What I would propose then is um, to say that the, the money that we have left in our balance that we didn't spend last year, we'd like to hold those dollars. And the reason we wanna hold them is we wanna see what the impact is when this pandemic and all the restrictions and government support starts to lift. If there's a whole bunch of renters who are about to be evicted when that happens, we'd like to be able to have sufficient dollars to be able to put together a program that responds to that. That could be a rent bank. We've discussed that as a board about the provision of a rent bank where you make micro loans to people to save them from being evicted. It could look like an extension of the emergency assistance program, which is a grant, not a loan. So, I think no one really is sure what that's gonna look like when this is all over, but we do feel that it would be prudent to have a reserve that we could bring forward a suggestion to yourselves as the board to say, we think we should use that money to do X, Y, and Z, given the impact that this has had on the renter community in our cities. So that's really uh, one of the things I wanna say to you is that we didn't spend that money because we wanted to be clear about who we were and what we were doing. And we'd like to retain that underspend as, an, as a way of cushioning the impact when the pandemic lifts and when the government support starts to dry up for renters and for landlords and that sort of thing. So I don't expect a, a response from you right this second on that, but just to put that out there for your consideration. You know? So I'll leave that um, for the second there. That's the Regional Housing Service. And then this slide speaks to that, just the potential things we're looking at. Um, rent bank functions, et cetera. But again, what we would do is try to evaluate the situation and bring it forward for your consideration to say, this is what we would like to do with that unspent allocation from last year. Going forward, we now are clear about who we are and what we do. We will be bringing in additional staff uh, in a variety of roles to help us build our capacity to build affordable housing in the community. So going forward, there won't be an underspend on the allocation, but that's the situation as we stand right now. So I suppose that's the, the general uh, gist of where we are, uh, what we're gonna be looking at going forward and where we're, we've been for the last six months. Um, so maybe I'll pause right there and I'll uh, take down the PowerPoint slide and, uh, and perhaps if there's any questions or any dialogue you'd like to have on that, then we'll have to, um, to do that. I just have to- Yeah, thank you very much, John. If you, yeah, take that down and I'll look to my directors to see if there's questions and I'm assuming there will be. I see, ah, Director. Okay, I recognize Director uh, Nicholson first and then Director Wilson. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to John for all the hard work through this COVID thing. I know it's been a huge effort and I really appreciate what you've done. Thank you, Director Nicholson. 
Okay, and I, I move now to Director Wilson and then Director Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks for that, John. Good stuff. Um, it's a shame the uh, we, this pandemic has uh, stopped our getting together in a, in a more uh, personal uh, thing. I've missed the meetings. Um, if you could just um, comment, please, on the recent um, inspections of the three MOTI sites that uh, uh, that I wasn't be able to attend, just to bring the uh, the uh, board up to date on on those three particular things. Bearing in mind that um, there is a bearing in mind that there is a land shortage, but that's the biggest problem we got at the moment. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Director Wilson. And uh, well, I'll just preface that for the rest of the board in the sense that we have been discussing with a um, group of folks the need for a housing in the South um, Cowichan region um, for seniors. And um, there's been a decision that we should really try to look at how we create affordable housing for people living so south of, the, of Dutton, that's it. And, and, and we started looking at well, where would a project land um, in that area? And there's not a lot of free land, as you can imagine, running around the South Belgian region. So one of the steps we took was to identify um, sites held by the provincial government. And uh, Ministry of Transportation owns a number of properties in the south um, um, end of the Belgian region. And so we approached them to look at, are there properties that the ministry could potentially make available to the community um, to affordable housing on. So they were very gracious and they provided us with a, a range of sites that we could go and examine. Um, now you can imagine these are Ministry of Transportation sites. So there are gravel pits, there's uh, verges and road ends. And so they're not necessarily what you would find in the middle of a suburban neighborhood. So the sites tend to be uh, adjacent to the island uh, highway, the Trans Canada Highway. So we went and looked at the four properties that the Ministry of Transport identified as potentially available. And of those four properties, uh, one is in the agricultural land reserves. We recognize that the impossibility of pulling a property out of the ALR for a residential development, particularly a multifamily development. So typically we don't go running at the ALR because it's just not really a, um, a viable option. So that one site is off the table. The other sites would require rezoning. That's pretty much the case of any piece of land you're going to encounter that's, so to speak, gifted to you. Um, so the, of the two, we identified that they're both viable sites for the scale and scope of development that would be um, appropriate. Um, but where we, we struggle a little bit is they're not necessarily adjacent to commercial services such as grocery stores. So if you are housing an elderly population and you wanted some walkability, then the Ministry of Transportation sites don't deliver a great walkability score, if you will. But nonetheless, um, those are sites that we've examined, and uh, we're happy to proceed to request one of those sites from the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, I will add one more element, as if we'd like to go and look um, at other options that are more uh, closer to village centers, for example. But again, um, that's the discussion we held yesterday with members of the, of the committee, and we will be proceeding to um, perhaps ask the Ministry of Transportation for one of those sites or both. We'll see. So that is a good thing that it's better than nothing. It's too bad the sites aren't closer to services, but that's what you get when you go looking for Ministry of Transportation. Yeah, yeah. thanks for that, John. Uh, follow up, please, Madam Chair. Go ahead, follow up. Thank you very much. Um, you did mention, John, about the uh, the leveraging and the skin in the game, and I think you mentioned some figures uh, in your presentation there. Um, could you just, um, just expand on that? Uh, that? There has been a fair amount of leverage that you've managed to to, uh, to gain. Um, and the last thing is, uh, I'm glad to see that you've got, uh, you're exercising some oversight on some of the money that you're, you're handing out to the other, um, the organization, but basically the, um, the leveraging that's been going on so far. Thank you. I would highlight probably the leveraging that's in place with the uh, Lady Smith Resource Center Association capital contribution to that was $317,000 from CPRD uh, ratepayers money. Um, Aaron can probably correct me, but I believe the capital budget for the uh, latest Smith projects is, is hovering in the $8 million range, and that's 36 units of housing. So um, that's a pretty good leverage, 317 yielding an $8 million investment in Lady Smith. The two $25,000 investments that we've made into the Duncan Manor and the um, 
Lake Cowichan one. I think if we uh, contemplate that successful 250 unit development of uh, Duncan Manor, and I've got my, you see my fingers crossed on that one because we're a long ways from that. But if that was to come to fruition, 250 units, I'm going to have to take a stab at how much that's worth, but it's got to be a $25 million in number, you know. Um, Lake Cowichan is a more um, uh, kind of a smaller scale development, and I'm anticipating they're going to land someone with 30 to 40 unit scale. They're, con con they're doing those studies now to see what that will hold, that site. But that's my likely guess, given the size of the property, you'll end up to 40 to 50 unit scale. So that puts you into the eight to $10 million scale of investment as well. So those are, uh, some of those are conjectural investments that we hope they'll be coming down the pipe down at, at some point in the future. But I would say that if we go back to the other leveraging, which is what we've leveraged on the COVID dollars, uh, there has been some sacrifice of time from myself as executive director and from Morgan Satterton, our admin person. Nonetheless, um, from taxpayer dollars from the CBRD, the only thing we've contributed to that um, COVID response is our time as an agency. And yet, we've managed to pull into the community uh, $490,000. So that's a zero capital for 490 return, I guess, whatever math that comes out to be. So, and I think that as we move forward, we'll continue to look for those leveraging opportunities. I really do believe that's our primary function is to use a little bit of money to squeeze a lot of money out of the portfolio. So we'll continue to do that as we go forward. That's great. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I look forward to, to meeting up again personally. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, I turn to Director Morrison, and I'm thinking that's the only hand. Oh, Director McGonigal has a question after that. Go ahead, Director Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, through you uh, to uh, to John and and I. You know, I really appreciate your presentation and your, the diligence in the books and and your response to uh, to questions that are posed in the public input portion and just want to you know say that that you know we don't often go into this third party service delivery model and we don't we don't do it often and we don't do it easily and I just want to say uh, and and sort of congratulate that it confirms in me and inspires confidence that you know for us as local governments and stewards of the public purse that that entrusting those dollars in CHA, I think you're reporting out and, and your on the ground work is, uh, is, you know, proven out at least to this point that uh, you're doing a good job with the, with the public dollars. So I want to congratulate you. Uh, I also want to thank you too for being responsive to those public input uh, questions and, and queries, uh, especially in delivering the, some of the mandate that was discussed in the in the public consent process to set up this function initially. So, so, so good job on that. But I, the question that I have is, it, it's evident by some of what we heard in the public input that there is likely some need for some community engagement at some point in the future. Uh, I think some of those questions were more directed towards you guys than, than more to us. So uh, when COVID-19 uh, will allow for us to do more community engagement, uh, do you have plans to get out into the community? And, and you know, I might even just suggest from from what we've heard today that maybe uh, starting off in the South End might be a good idea. So if, what, what have you got in that realm? I think that's an excellent question because we too feel the lack of ability to go in and engage with community and that's certainly been our intent all along to have a regular opportunities to have people come to and we use the frame of you know information sessions and stuff but in many ways what we what we wanted to do was create opportunities for people to come and be in those kind of larger group settings and have that face-to-face -face engagement and be able to answer questions and speak to issues we're missing that. That's my style of working very much, and I find this COVID thing has crimped that style quite a bit. So we're hoping that we're seeing now that there, there's this sort of tolerance, I guess, or uh, acceptance of smaller group settings that's a potential. So maybe the way to forward for us is to look at how we do that, but really with a smaller scale in mind rather than large community meetings. Maybe we have to be really scaling it down to small group settings. And, finding a way to do that. I'd very much like to do that. Um, secondly, I think that what we anticipate bringing on board with college and housing is someone who's going to be a lot more on top of the social media world than I am. I'm a bit of a, I must say, an old school guy. You know, like, so me, to spend my time on Facebook probably isn't wise, and that's not my skill set. 
we want to bring someone into the organization who's able to really provide a lot more uh, presence from college and housing into the into the social media world and that's I think a lot of people get their information from that source these days so we'd like to be able to do that more effectively as well so I think that in discussions with members of the community advisory committee they're also seeing that m missing that piece around the ability to, to meet with people and engage and so they're requesting that we kind of reconvene that group and find ways to do that so I think that's the mechanism we'll use going forward bring the count community advisory committee together that's a small enough group that it adheres to the guidelines from Dr. Bonnie and so then we can plot out a way that we can continue doing small group settings and get back into engaging with folks so thank you I turn to Director McGonigal and then to close Director Salmon go ahead Director McGonigal oh and then it's not, not to close and then we also go to Director Smith after that go ahead please Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And I thank you for mentioning the complexity of some of these projects, Mr. Horn, uh, from construction um, to conception does, conception to construction does take a considerable amount of time. You mentioned the Couch and Lake Elder Care Society, which is the second entity that has looked at uh, seniors affordable housing within our area, including surrounding uh, electoral areas for the past 15 years. The, the seed funding that's been lauded through uh, Couch and Housing Association has brought this project further in this past two years than we have in the previous 15. Mm -hmm. I think there's a public perception on the implementation of the CHA on brick and mortar being in the first year. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's not the case, as you state, from conception to construction is uh, problematic at times. By identifying those projects, I would piggyback on Director Morrison's public engagement to, to reach out to Ladysmith, for instance, who is currently building that project and, and tooting your own horn and the CHA's uh, horn and the function that was established on how that levering worked. Mm -hmm. And when the uh, Duncan Manor and the other one do get built, because I believe they will, that would be another opportunity to uh, public engage on the successes of, of this function. And I will state uh, in public that I was not strongly in favor of this at the implementation as a few other directors at the table were a little apprehensive, but I see the leveraging that has worked in the previous couple of years, and I believe it is worthwhile function and project. So thank you very much. Thank you. We go to Director Salmon. Yeah, thank you. I just want to very briefly add my thanks and support for your work. As, as others have said, <laughs> this was a, uh, the, the referendum was controversial. Not everyone supported it, but I think your, your approach and your um, examples of the leverage really give us all the confidence that this uh, is a good idea and it's uh, paying off and well warranted. So thank you. Thanks. I go to now to Director Smith for the final comment or question. Director Smith. Uh, thank you, through the chair. I um, did a tiny bit of calculation and I noticed that with the Victoria Foundation and the um, funds from the government, uh, it comes to about $710,000. And that money went to help 107 people, which is over 6,600 per person. And uh, that's a nice allotment of funds for each individual to help move them along. Uh, we know that there's many people in our community that are struggling that are not part of this, uh, this program. And uh, some of them, I think, are still getting left uh, through the gaps, and uh, I'm sure that you're looking to capture those people. Um, one of the things I was just going back to a, an email that we received from uh, Diane Allen, and I know when we went to the meetings uh, to for the, the CBRD's information regarding the housing, uh, it there was a lot of concentration on advising people that the money would be for um, in moderate, low to moderate income households, including families with children, lone parent families, singles, and seniors. 
And I think that's what's in people's minds as they're looking at the funding and all of a sudden the funding is being diverted for rent, diverted for this, diverted for that. They see uh, the pandemic has come along and the money is now shifting and moving. And I, I think that we need to, when we look at um, your budgets, that we have ours a little the the funding from the taxpayers be a little bit more separate from mm -hmm. the other funding because when you can see the flow through of the the grant funding that's received for other projects that are not actually what the taxpayers ha are funding i think there needs to be a, a way of dividing that to help people understand because they see money moving and shifting and I, I know that that's confusing. It's confusing for everyone. But right now, um, you know, you're doing an amazing job. I know that we all appreciate it. And, um, you know, I think that there's, did it really take a pandemic for the government to actually step up mm -hmm. to start looking at the funding of some of our situations in our valley? So uh, it's good that we already have people in place for that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Yes, and I know that the um, statements being a general ledger capture everything. And, and so what we'll try to do for you then is create a set of statements that separate those activities out so that you can see clearly which pieces are which, you know. And that money is still continuing to flow through our coffers and through drill until September 30th. So there wouldn't be a final accounting, but we'll try to make that clear for folks so they can see which money is going to which things, you know. So we appreciate those comments as well. Great job. I'd like oh, to follow yeah, up. I think, that, I think that would really assist uh, the public when they're looking at the statements. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, I'd like to thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horn, and um, and also your staff as well and your board for the great work. And I, too, echo everybody else's comments. And uh, I know you and I have been working with the South End and hope to continue that. And I appreciate everything. And we'll now do our a virtual clap for you. Um, Thank you so much. All right. Yeah, do you need any further? Do you need anything further from us then? Oh, I think you're on mute. Moving on to another delegation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And as Lego, we have the tourism oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for giving us some time. Madam Chair, can I interrupt for a moment? Yes, please. We really need to fix that sound. Is somebody working on it? It's gonna get, get cause a migraine for me. Like. Um, Sorry, we don't hear any sound. It's like a beeping, squeaking sound, and, and Madam Chair asked about it earlier. It's still going. Nothing, so, at, this, nothing at this end here. Okay. It is on my end as well. Um, is that IT sure. one still open? It has to be. Yeah, it has to be. That's part of this. It's it's the... Um, uh, uh, Barb Mohan can also hear it. It is a squealing that I hear. It's a really fine squealing that's quite annoying. And if um, for, some people, for some people, even more so. So um, maybe we can just let staff work on that while we move towards if everybody's uh, uh, Ms. Weiner, Weiner can hear it too. So and so can um, Director Sebring. And so can Director Justice. So could we, I don't know where we go with this. I need some help here. Is there a phone number we could call in instead? Actually, you're fine. It's oh, not okay. you. I don't okay. think it's you any longer. Um, it, it's fine to, for, um, oh, it's weird. Some of us are hearing it, some are not. Currently, I can't hear it. So something has changed. So Did go we have that IT open before? Because we've never had this before. Well, it's still open and I don't hear the sound anymore. It was from the previous oh. delegate who just left. Now that they've left and are muted and gone, you will not hear that sound anymore. IT has to remain open as this is the streaming platform that uses the audio for the boardroom. 
Thank you so much Thank for that. You. Thank you so much for that clarification. And I do not hear that sound any longer. And I'm going to move to delegation two and welcome Jill Nessel, Executive Director of Tourism Cowichan. Go ahead, please. Sorry for all the delays. Okay. I'm Janet Doherty. I'm not Jill, but Jill. Oh, the okay. Sorry. And Je oh, no. hi, Janet. I can't really tell that it's you. Hi, Janet. I'm going to um, also say you know you that you have 10 minutes. And if you need more, maybe you could ask that now because I can only see my directors now. You have I, a PowerPoint I will not be able to. No, we don't have a PowerPoint. We just want to update a little bit. I don't think we'll need more than 10 minutes. Awesome. Go so ahead. Thank you asking us some questions if you so wish. Um, so really we just, you've got our report uh, and you can see where we're spending the money. But really we wanted to take this opportunity to update everybody on the gravity of the situation of what's happening right now and how it's caused tourism couch and to pivot. Um, we always like to find the silver lining is in even the most horrible things. Uh, so I think we have. Um, we have because of the support that we have out there. So just a couple of things to update people on uh, to give you an idea of where the tourism and hospitality industry is at right now. Um, it's the only industry almost entirely based on the discretionary movement of people. The tourism and hospitality sector has been the most severely impacted by COVID due to business closure orders and restrictions on personal travel, as well as the closure of international bar borders. Of all of this, I'm sure everybody's aware, um, but I'm not sure if everybody's aware of how severe it is for the industry that we're representing. And despite the commencement of phase three on June 24th, many businesses have only partially reopened. We are going to see people shutting doors. It's just going to happen. So prior to COVID-19, a few numbers here for you. Tourism was the BC, BC's fastest growing sector, reaching 21 billion in annual revenue with over 19,000 businesses and 300,000 workers in the sector. Uh, so you can extrapolate for couch and down, but obviously tourism is extremely um, important to our overall economy and taxes, et cetera. For the BC tourism industry, 73.4% of tourism businesses are less than 20 employees. 17.9 between 20 to 49, 8.7 larger than 50. The couch, and while we don't have exact numbers, we would estimate the majority of our businesses are gonna fall under that 20. So these are not large businesses we're speaking of. These are a lot of small operations that need help, and that's what TCS has done, Tourism Couch and Society has done, is pivoted to address some of these issues. So we're not just talking about marketing. Um, so what we have done is we have aligned provincially um, and we want you to know about some of these opportunities because we think that you can also be accessing um, assistance through us. Provincially, we're directly um, connected through to the Ministry of Tourism um, and they have been giving a lot of attention to the tourism uh, industry. Destination BC, um, and these organizations are looking at some of the broader issues which affect us even in couch. And so the international travel, the federal imp implications, what it means for us in terms of being able to find employees or lack thereof, um, which has become even more difficult in this COVID period. Regionally, we're, look we're working with our partners and our contractors at Tourism Vancouver Island and Destination Greater Victoria. Um, these organizations are fabulous for us um, in Cowichan. They've done some excellent, excellent work in the resiliency program, and they've been giving direct connection to our stakeholders. So our stakeholders can access these uh, funds, um, learn of different marketing opportunities and techniques that they can use. Um, they've been able to access some, some various assistance with how do they open safe in COVID time periods. Uh, and I know a lot of our businesses in Cowichan are, are very scared in what comes in September when they can no longer go out into the streets because of weather, well, September, October, um, and they go down to low capacity and revenues uh, plummet once again. Um, so regionally, our associations with, or sorry, our connections with Tourism Vancouver Island and Destination Greater Victoria have been absolutely amazing. Uh, and we've been spending quite a bit of time with them. So pivoting locally, um, we're not spending a lot of our money looking uh, outside of BC, but really we're really very, very focused on, on local. We're focused on reminding our locals to buy local 
to stay local, to be a tourist right here in your hometown. That also stretches down to Victoria, of course, and up to Nanaimo. Um, but this is the kind of traveling that's taking place. Um, so it's, it's a, also about informing people what local means. Um, so there's a bunch of education that's going on in that, and we're using these marketing dollars to do that and to give that kind of support. Um, destination marketing, as I said, is mostly focused on Vancouver Island right now. Um, and we're working more on destination development than we ever had before. Um, so there's dollars being spent. And examples of that are close to home. Some are our wine festival is being done in different ways because obviously we can't do festivals anymore. Um, and uh, working closely with businesses within Cowichan, um, Cowichan Strong, uh, VIBTR program, and Jill can speak more to that. But we also wanted to make sure that um, we were leaving the doors open to, to you at the CVRD, any of you as directors, to come to us directly. Because with this support that we have directing um, right into the Ministry of Tourism, as well as with Destination BC, Tourism Vancouver Island, uh, that we can be a resource for you. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Please don't hesitate to ask us questions because we do need to do business differently. If we want to be, uh, to, if we want to see our businesses survive, we, we need to work all together, and that's what we've been trying to do. Um, moving forward, we would hope to come back to you uh, in the near future. Um, we have been speaking with Anthony Everett, who's the CEO of Tourism Vancouver Island, and also the CEO of Destination Greater Victoria with Paul Nursey, and um, having them come and speak with you as well on uh, particular matters pertaining to, to the economics and how things can help Cowichan. Um, with that, I think the report just stands. If you had any specific questions on it, uh, Jill's here as well as Nick is here, although you maybe you can't see them in the window right now, um, but they're right beside me. So if you have any questions with regard to what I've just said right now or with regards to what's in the report, um, we're here and ready. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I do have, um, I have one director, Director Acton. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, hi, Janet. Uh, can, can you forward that information then? I'd like to actually set up a Zoom with our businesses, uh, maybe like sometime ne end of next week. Uh, so for so who we should contact, like who, who, who's your direct person now? So direct person, you're talking about at Tourism Vancouver Island. I'm not entirely sure the question. I apologize. Well, so what I'd like to do is invite Tourism Cowichan to come speak with our via uh, Zoom with our businesses, perhaps at the end of next week or whenever there's some as soon as possible of how we could uh, leverage your offer and to help support some of the local businesses. Awesome. And, and if you could forward your executive directors or who 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 would who would be the best person to set that up with <laughs> hi <laughs> hi 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 there and because i don't know if you noticed our initiative here in the south we did actually create a go local directory that has all of south couch and businesses in it so maybe we can work to get we can help uh promote that but as well talk to our local businesses I will send you uh, an email with all my contact information and then we can coordinate something together. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Director Morrison, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you, uh, and welcome, Janet, and I've been looking forward to this opportunity to, to pose a question because I, I believe I was at one of your informal sessions and I'm thinking it was last summer and the topic of Airbnbs came up and the fact that you seem to have some compliance from from the larger organizations and platforms to contribute to the MRDT uh, program. So, you know, I thought that was kind of a good thing, but something has just emerged recently that is really problematic and I think has been in doubly so or, or maybe more in regards to COVID-19 and that's those businesses that have the built infrastructure in place. They've got the small hotels or retreats and that sort of thing. They've had to follow the rules. They've had to be closed. But what has emerged is this underground market for short-term rentals that is is not contributing to MRDT. They're they're fly they're on these online platforms. And what I'm talking about are those 
those one-off waterfront properties or the RV parks that have park model homes in them that, you know, are normally only used, you know, two to four weeks a year. And now there's this burgeoning market of unregistered and unauthorized uh, rentals going on in places where first the zoning doesn't allow it and and even their their boards or associations are having trouble pushing back on on individual owners who do use them for recreation but they're finding that they're this huge cash cow i heard one property owner made 12 grand last year for a couple or three months of rentals so you know those are off the books those aren't contributing to mrdt from what we understand and they're really putting the pinch on the motels hotels and the other built infrastructure so have you heard of this developing as as an issue and and do you have any comment on how we might get uh, some of these unauthorized activities back into the mrdt stream and compliant with local rules well so this isn't a COVID issue this has been going on for quite some time it's it's an issue with uh you know and, there, and there's both sides of the coin with it as well but I think the really big issue that has been acknowledged is when people start buying properties, Airbnbs, and they no longer are just having a one or two room Airbnb, which isn't really the big problem. The big problem is when you have people buying multiple Airbnbs and they're flying under the radar and not contributing. Um, so, you know, if I had the answer to it, I would be super as well because it's a, it's a big issue all, all the way around. Um, but you know, it, I would suggest that it probably has something to do with zoning, and really the biggest problem is enforcement of that zoning. Uh, when it's an online platform, the platform itself has been designated to take uh, MRDT and to, to submit on their behalf. So there, I don't know actually how well that's, that's actually um, being executed. Uh, so that that means if you're gonna use some of these online bigger platforms, uh, you, it's easy to get caught. <laughs> or it's easy to be identified. Um, but I think that's where it comes down to. And it's, and it's an MRDT issue, but it's also a bigger issue as well because hotels have all kinds of other things that they have to conform to. And you'll see that in other operations as well. It's part of the, uh, part of the digital world that we live in and the online platforms that are sort of taking over. It's a big problem. Thank you, Jenna. Well, thank you very much, Janet. I do, I do not see any other speakers, and I want to thank you and um, know that you're going through um, a very tough time right now, and we're thinking of you all at this time. It's, it's really tragic. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you, and we will have a 10-minute break. Let's come back at 11.10. Oh, virtual clap. Sorry, I missed the virtual clap. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Um, yeah, 10 minute break. We'll come back at 1110. Thank you. Camera's live. Okay, moving now to um, back to our agenda. We moved to unfinished business one, which we moved up earlier. And I turn to, I believe it is Mr. Mr. O'Reardon. Hello. Hello, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Thief Tourism Couchin Society have left the call, so I'm hoping there aren't any additional questions um, from, the, from the staff report. Um, the initial report was presented in April and a uh, committee requested that Tourism Couch and Society resubmit um, their financial, uh, their annual work plan and budget to take account of COVID-19. So they have now done this um, with the result of total projected revenue um, being reduced by 43% compared to their initial budget. And um, they've posted some of the, the adjustments they've made in terms of their tactical plan to account for this. So um, I'll put it back to, to committee to if there's any comments or questions around this. Uh, Ms. Legault, I see that we have a recommendation here. Would you like to read the recommendation? 
chair the recommendation is that it be recommended to the board on July 22nd 2020 that the tourism couch and amended 2020 annual work plan and budget as outlined in the economic development division staff report to the July 2020 July 22nd 2020 regional services committee be approved looking to committee it's been moved and seconded are there any questions for mr. O'Riordan I'm going to call the question. All in favor? Opposed, if any. Motion's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving back now to reports. Ms. Legault. Thank you, Madam Chair. Item R1 is a report from the Environmental Services Division on the Regional Surface Water Quality Monitoring Strategy, and Mr. Lawrence has a brief introduction. Go ahead, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, directors. Good morning. And okay, so so thank you, uh, directors, for this opportunity to to share with you. Uh, really the first uh, piece of work uh, that is coming through under the, the Drinking Water and Watershed uh, Protection Plan program. Uh, and uh, essentially this is being presented uh, for uh, in integration into the 10-year Drinking Water and Watershed Protection Plan. And uh, wanted to clarify a few scoping items uh, before we get started though. Uh, this, this strategy that, that we're going to be presenting here uh, really deals with uh, the, the surface water uh, quality monitoring of freshwater sources, freshwater bodies uh, within our regional district boundary, so within those watersheds. Uh, and it's an, it's an important milestone because, again, it is that first piece that's coming through under the plan, uh, but it is, it is one piece, uh, and I want to emphasize that. We do have additional uh, pieces of work strategies that will be coming through for groundwater monitoring, uh, for hydrometric monitoring, uh, and we'll also be having uh, additional programs and pieces come through for strengthening our collaborative uh, frameworks with other agencies. And and, uh, and 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 when we talk about that, uh, that's that's some work that is that can go a long ways towards uh, expanding the the scope and our ability uh, to protect our watersheds. And, and start to consider uh, some additional items that folks may be interested in, uh, such as marine water quality sampling uh, in, in our, our marine areas surrounding the region. But at this time, this drinking water, uh, this surface water quality monitoring strategy uh, deals specifically with the, the freshwater bodies within, within our regional district boundary. And so, uh, so with, that, uh, with that context, uh, the this development of, of a drinking water and watershed protection strategy, a uh, 10-year plan was brought forward to the board recently, uh, and it was developed with a tremendous amount of input from, uh, from a large range of, of, of agencies and members of, of the community. And within that plan, there is a key priority program area to improve climate and water monitoring networks. And, uh, and this uh, strategy uh, the water quality protection strategy uh, speaks directly to uh, this action of needing to characterize surface and ground and surface water uh, quality, but it also relates to a number of these other action areas and uh, is is supportive of those actions, but also the other actions uh, support uh, this 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 uh, strategy to uh, to have a monitoring program for surface water quality. And so, so with that, uh, there were a number of key project outcomes and objectives in this, uh, in this program. Uh, and uh, they included first uh, to be able to establish an appropriate internal uh, data warehousing structure. Uh, it was recognized that there are a number of data sources uh, that a tremendous amount of work has been done uh, with regards to, to water quality testing uh, in our region. Uh, to be able to have uh, a data source uh, and, and structure that we can go to uh, and that other folks uh, within the community can access to, 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 to look at that data and be able to use it. A second piece was to undertake a data analysis 
of that existing water quality uh, based on um, uh, uh, sites of concern, uh, but also look at trends in relationship to, to land use and watershed characteristics. And uh, the consultants that we were working with on this project, uh, Palmer Consultants, uh, did uh, were able to conduct some level of data analysis, but also presented some recommendations for the need to strengthen uh, the the long term data record. So we're looking at uh, we're talking about a ten year data record uh, to be able to really conduct uh, a valuable trends analysis between land use and watershed characteristics uh, and and the water quality uh, results that uh, that would come through. Another important piece. Here was to finalize water quality targets uh, for the Mill Bay and Cowichan Bay areas, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. Uh, but also to to develop this this strategy uh, based on these uh, these three uh, key pieces of work uh, that come before, uh, and the strategy includes uh, uh, a sampling work plan uh, and a working budget for the next ten years. Uh, another piece that. Uh, is being refined is this development of a training manual uh, for sample collection, uh, but also for QA, QC of the data and uh, the samples, uh, as well as submission of those samples for, for lab analysis. And that's something that uh, we look forward to, uh, to putting into place so that we can have uh, effective working relationships with, with volunteers who can support the program. And uh, going to bear with me as I advance the, the slides here. So uh, again, uh, when we talk about the, we talked a little bit about the, the water quality targets, uh, but it's important to take a step back and look at uh, what kind of water quality monitoring uh, and, and where it has been happening already within the region. And so uh, there's two important components to, to water quality monitoring. One is uh, the establishment of objectives, essentially a reference that we can compare results to. Uh, as well as the, the attainment monitoring, which is that act of going out and getting samples to, to understand how they compare against those references. And so we have objectives established in a number of CBRD uh, watersheds, uh, uh, the Cowichan watershed, Cooksila watershed, uh, more recently, uh, Shawnigan Creek watershed, uh, Shimanus uh, River, Holland, and, and Stocking Creek. Uh, and at the same time, uh, through that, we had objectives in progress for the Mill Bay and Cowichan Bay uh, areas. So that was uh, something that uh, is still in progress with the province. Uh, but having said that, um, we recognized that we did need to have that, that reference standard in place, uh, and that it was a priority for these, these two areas. Uh, which do incl include uh, some of the, the marine areas of Cowichan Bay and, and Mill Bay, uh, but to, to have uh, CBRD-based uh, targets uh, for those areas uh, in the absence of, of objectives that are, that are already established. And so while the, the province will continue to finalize those, uh, uh, the, the staff report presents uh, targets for the Mill Bay and Cowichan Bay watersheds. And a little bit about the difference between those two, um, really, the similarity again is that they are a reference from for which we can compare uh, water quality uh, impacts to to land use pressures uh, within those areas. Uh, but uh, the, the 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 CBRD targets uh, give us some ability to help us understand where we can focus more intensive sampling uh, within specific areas. Uh, they also can help guide the issuing of, of permits, licenses. Uh, as well as uh, management of, of, the, of the land base and, and uh, larger community planning. Uh, but um, the, the, the water quality objectives that the province would establish are indeed something that is, is uh, signed off by the, the minister uh, and gives uh, the province uh, an, a reference for looking at some of the high level resource management decisions that are made around uh, um, uh, forestry and, and other uh, resource sectors. And so the, the, the strategy that was specifically developed under the Drinking Water and Watershed Monitoring Program uh, and the, the surface water quality component of that uh, looked at two, two key components. And really in the, in the strategy that we've presented uh, and worked on with a tremendous amount of input from uh, internal staff as well as a technical and community advisory group, um, 
focused on the initial piece focused on this permanent long term monitoring program and and really that's about uh, looking at a, 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 ra a broad range of sites across the region that can give us a consistent long term data record uh, that gives us an ability to do spatial and seasonal uh, and, and uh, trends analysis against uh, uh, land use pressures, uh, while at the same time uh, giving us uh, an opportunity to look at what's happening in, in each of the watersheds uh, within the region. Uh, whereas uh, the intensive short-term monitoring program is really something uh, that can get triggered by those long-term uh, monitoring program results. So where there are concerns uh, and issues identified, there's an opportunity there to, to go and do uh, more intensive focused sampling in a smaller area, a sub-basin perhaps, or a specific surface water body within, within a watershed. And so what the strategy uh, ultimately looks like once we had that, again, that opportunity to look at gathering uh, input from uh, that broad group of community members, as well as uh, various agencies, uh, Island Health, um, working with uh, our First Nations partners, as well as um, uh, the other provincial agencies, um, we, we were able to identify this this, this group of, of sites, uh, which uh, most of which are within the province's uh, environmental management system, referred to as, as EMS. Uh, but there are there were also um, opportunities for sites uh, in, in places where we did not have any monitoring. So for example, uh, the Yellow Point uh, Benchlands area, and, and in talking with, with folks, including First Nations in that area, uh, the importance of having sampling uh, in in places uh, uh, like like the tributaries that go that flow through the Yellow Point uh, benchlands, and so having uh, uh, this broad group of sites, and then uh, working with the group to develop uh, a risk framework to evaluate uh, which of those sites should be prioritized for inclusion in the strategy at this time, and that risk framework uh, considered a number of factors, including. A watershed's risk analysis that was uh, recently conducted, uh, as well as um, other characteristics, including uh, the sizes of the watersheds, uh, as well as the, um, the, the the location of that sampling point within a watershed. So, uh, in an early part of the program, being able to look at those uh, those downstream sources and be able to pr prioritize those, so that we can identify potential upstream. Uh, Problems that could be focused in and and uh, and, and have a, a greater um, an opportunity to dive into more detail in those uh, through a, a short-term program, perhaps. And so uh, and so with that, uh, the 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 the, pro, the the water quality monitoring program that uh, is presented uh, recognizes that uh, there it needs to be able to have synergies with the other. Uh, programs out there, including the provincial water quality uh, program, as we were talking about, uh, but also liquid waste management, uh, recognizing the uh, the active uh, amendments uh, that are going on uh, in the South Cowichan for liquid waste management, uh, but also uh, ongoing and future work in the central sector, uh, looking at informing community-based uh, programs, uh, but also uh, land use change uh, requirements. Uh, and including uh, linkages to the uh, modernized and harmonized official community planning processes. The next steps uh, for this, uh, this project are really, uh, as, as mentioned in the staff report, to integrate uh, this monitoring strategy into the drinking water and watershed protection 10-year program. Uh, and, and key to emphasize here that uh, monitoring uh, wouldn't be expected to begin until 2021. And, and that, of course, would be pending the, uh, the, the ability to have additional resources, additional staff uh, to, to do this. And, uh, and so that's pending that, uh, that, uh, that decision, that go ahead for, for staffing. Uh, the, uh, another key step is con confirmation of the site selection for that long-term monitoring piece. Uh, and uh, to be able to, uh, to, to based on uh, uh, the, the overall, overall look at the strategy uh, and uh, what what is available uh, in terms of resources to complete within the the drinking water and watershed protection uh, strategy, uh, and uh, to be able to finalize that and bring that forward for 
uh, budget uh, considerations in, in 2021. Uh, also important is the identification of community organizations that are interested in supporting the implementation of the, the, uh, the program. And we do have a number that have already been active and we are, are fortunate in that way to have uh, a number that can support this. Uh, training of those volunteers, uh, as mentioned, uh, ongoing collaboration with the province uh, to, uh, to continue the development of that data management system. And of course, working with partners, uh, both internally and externally, uh, so that we can have uh, a, a greater information base that can help us understand the correlation to, to land use metrics. And emphasizing again that this is one piece within that uh, DWWP 10-year program, uh, we will be coming forward with uh, separate strategies for groundwater hydrometrics, so that's the flow monitoring, uh, as well as opportunities for collaboration with senior levels of government uh, and other opportunities to, to look at how we deal with uh, problems uh, within and, and issues and, uh, and opportunities for understanding uh, conditions within our marine environment as well. And so with that, um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share. And if, if there are any questions, um, I'd be glad to, uh, to respond to those. Are there, any, are there any questions for Mr. Lawrence? And you'd have to take your presentation down for me to see my fellow directors. Thank you. Okay, I have Mr. Wilson, Director Wilson, Director Salmon, and Director Nicholson. And, ooh, okay, just a second here. I have, uh, go ahead, Director Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, now, am I on? I think I'm on. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Am I on? Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you, Martin. That's great. Um, the, as you know, I've been quite passionate about drinking water and aquifer protection for many years, even before my entry into politics. So I, I, I welcome any initiative, uh, initiatives, and, and I'm going to follow these very carefully. Um, you mentioned a, an expansion to groundwater monitoring at a later date. Um, do you have any estimate of, of a time period for that, or is that still in the planning stages? And Madam Chair, I do have a couple of follow-ups as well. Thank you. Mr. Lawrence? So the other planning components, we do expect to, to have those in progress this year. Uh, and again, uh, continue with those those planning pieces for, for groundwater and hydrometric monitoring uh, to be able to come back and incorporate those into 2021 uh, programs. And again, the actual implementation of those plans though, uh, for, for all of these, uh, the hydrometric, the surface water quality and the groundwater quality uh, depends on that additional staffing uh, that is uh, that was initially proposed under this program but is, is currently on hold. Great follow up, please, Madam Chair. Yeah, and um, those watersheds which you mentioned, um, which may be identified as being at risk, uh, when you get that information, uh, and it will be, I, I appreciate, you know, a matter of time and uh, and analysis, uh, will that uh, information be shared with the public uh, or, and directors, bearing in mind that it will be fairly sensitive information, but is it going to be shared or is it going to be, you see what I'm going here? So uh, if I, uh, through the, through the chair, thank you. So through the chair, uh, thank you for the question. One of the key pieces of the drinking water and watershed protection program is that piece around communication, education, and awareness of about our watershed. So this initial push is towards get understanding our watersheds, building the watershed science component, uh, but there's a, also a significant part uh, that, will, that will include uh, going out and providing the, the education and awareness piece. Uh, the, the EMS system that, uh, that is in place by the province uh, does allow us to, uh, to manage data, but it also allows other folks to go and access information about, about water quality. And so uh, that is the goal, is to have something that is, is collaborative that we can, we can go and access this data and folks can, can use it. 
Great, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I do have some other questions, but uh, I'll uh, come in at the end of the other speakers, if that's okay with you. Okay, we're moving on now to, I have, I'm just gonna double check. I have Director Salmon, Director Nicholson, Alternate Director Justice, and Director Kuhn. Have I missed anyone? Director Morrison and Director Acton. Okay, everybody wants in on this. Oh, and, and Director Smith. Okay. Go ahead, please, Director Salmon. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, Keith, for the presentation. Um, just a timing question. I, I like the. I think it's great. We'll have the permanent, long-term data, the ten-year program. Um, but just how soon can we? Uh, um, would any of this be available to guide uh, planning decisions, um, like the targets, for example? Are they available now, and we could look at them for? zoning and permits and such. Mr. Lawrence. So, so, so thank you and, and through the chair, uh, that's a, a good question. We have, again, we have these water quality objectives uh, through the province, which are available online for, for anyone to access uh, and the water quality targets uh, will be made uh, available publicly. Uh, they are, they will be finalized in terms of, of having them on, uh, on, on CBRD uh, format, uh, but essentially those become uh, a reference, as mentioned, uh, that can be used to, to guide land use decisions and uh, something that can be used by our, our land services department in terms of, of informing uh, the decisions that are made uh, and, and understanding uh, water quality conditions. Uh, we already use uh, this information. So for example, the water quality objectives and, and targets and monitoring data that has helped us uh, inform uh, our liquid waste management planning. And so, uh, so some of this information is already being used, but um, uh, it's a great uh, point that there's an opportunity here to, to use that data and, and those reports uh, now that they are complete. So those, those targets reports can, can now be used in, in that regard. Maybe just follow up, Director Salmon. Thank you. Um, so thank you. That's great. I just maybe I just would like to hear from our planning, or maybe Mr. Alf. Is that in the works? Are we are we uh, using those targets now or shortly? Ms. Cheryl. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would recommend that. Um, Community Planning Division have the opportunity to review the information um, with other staff and, and then report back to you on how that information could be reflected through um, bylaws going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on now uh, to Director Nicholson, please. Thank you. Um, Thank, thank you, Keith. This is a, uh, the water quality uh, strategy is a, is a good thing. Um, I have a, a, I'd specifically like to talk about the Couch and Bay Target report, and I appreciate its draft, which is great. Um, I am wondering, first, first of all, was, was that reviewed with the Couch and Watershed Board uh, water quality uh, target group that, that works on water quality? Um, issues? Were they part of that development of, of that report? Mr. Lawrence? So I, I've been involved in the development of the Couch and Bay Water Quality Targets for, for some time, but that particular uh, report goes, goes way back to 2010 uh, when data was initially collected and, um, and uh, from the very moment of collecting samples, uh, working with folks from that group to, to go out and gather the data uh, as well as put together the report. And we did get uh, review from, from members of that, that group uh, into, into the one that has, has been presented today. So uh, we had that opportunity to, to, get, to get input. Uh, so um, hopefully that, uh, that helps answer your question. Thank you. I'd just like to say, Director Wilson, could you mute your microphone, please? Follow up, Director Nicholson. Yeah, so I have, um, I'm, I'm glad it's a draft report. I think it's a little bit out of date um, and needs to be updated because 
for, and I'm particularly concerned about this link between water quality and land use. And we have recently approved a rezoning on the estuary on the causeway. And the report does not identify that as a potential risk area. It speaks a lot about coliforms and the freshwater streams and so forth. But when we're trying to tie water quality to land use practices, I think it's really important that we identify the high risk land use practices and incorporate them into our water quality targets. And in addition, the report doesn't mention the notion of sea level rise and how that potentially adds risk to surface water contamination issues. So I would like to see that addressed, at least acknowledged in the report, and a rationale for either including it into the target program that you have or not. I mean, it should at least be addressed. And I know that I spoke to you yesterday about this issue, and your comment was that this was very much focused on freshwater. But I guess I would suggest that we really need to think about land use, and that's a land thing. And we also have really tried to focus on whole watershed thinking. And yes, we're starting to move into the marine environment in the Couch and Bay, but these are Couch and Bay water quality targets. And I think that we really need to incorporate the notion of metal fabrication and that risk into the report. Thank you. Moving on now to Alternate Director Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to Mr. Lawrence. On page three of the Palmer report, it says that the CVRD has at least 20 watersheds that are wholly or partially contained in its boundaries. But in North Couch, we tend to think of Quamich and Somnos as being self-contained watersheds, but in the report, they're lumped into the Couch and River watershed. And I was just wondering if you could explain why, if a watershed is defined on the basis of flowing into a marine environment, and would the Somnos freshwater system, for example, be considered a self-contained watershed if it flowed into the Couch and Estuary as opposed to the Couch and River just above the estuary? And finally, is it meaningful whether a watershed is defined as a watershed in terms of what monitoring actions are occurring there? Mr. Lawrence. So through the chair, thank you for those questions. Excellent questions around understanding and having common language around watersheds and what that represents. And really, that the watershed is the area of land that drains into a common water body, such as a lake or river, and ultimately flows down to the marine environment. And we do have in our region a number of watersheds that are single watershed areas, but we also have these bench land areas, which are a number of smaller series of watersheds that flow into the marine environment. And we've aggregated those together for planning purposes. In the case of the Quamich and Somnos watersheds, they do indeed flow into the Couch and River. And so we consider them as part of the Couch and watershed. But that's not to say that they can't have basin-specific actions or concerns that need to be addressed. And so in the monitoring program, we've included sampling within each of those areas, recognizing the pressures in that area and the way that those sites came through as higher priority, higher risk in need of being addressed. And so there's monitoring, long-term monitoring sites in those areas. And we look at watersheds as a basis for understanding water quality. 
uh, but also other uh, water, uh, uh, water resource conditions uh, so that we can understand uh, land use impacts. And it is, it is the, uh, the, the, uh, the unit of, of land uh, that allows us to do that in, in the best way possible, to be able to understand uh, land use impacts, uh, uh, the, the impacts of pollution on the receiving environment. Uh, we'll talk about receiving environment again, uh, these, these surface water bodies, uh, and uh, those that flow into uh, common water bodies that ultimately make their way down to the marine environment. And so uh, the watershed is, is uh, in a way, it's this way of, if you look at it at the bottom of the watershed, it gives you a snapshot of, of everything that's happening above it. And so uh, it, uh, it, 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 it's an, an aggregator for uh, all of the, the conditions above it. And uh, it, uh, it is uh, a good, a good tool and, and a use of, uh, of a land area that uh, allows us to do that. Thank you. If I might have a follow up, Madam Chair. Um, that, thank you, that was helpful. I just on a slightly different topic there. There are two classes of uh, monitoring sites listed on the map that you showed us, which is also on page 328 of the uh, agenda. There's CVRD plan long-term monitoring sites, and there are federal provincial monitoring sites. Can you confirm that the latter category sites are also going to be part of the long-term water quality monitoring of this strategy? So, so Mr. Lawrence, go ahead. So thank you for the question. Uh, through the chair, uh, those sites, yes, uh, thank you for, for noticing that, that uh, we have those sites that are essentially led by partnering organizations. And uh, it, it's an important point that we do need to continue to monitor and understand their commitment to, to keep up with monitoring those, those, those data points uh, because they are, they are recognized as, as higher priority. Uh, and that's uh, part of the dynamic nature of, of this water quality monitoring strategy. As much as we'd like to, we'd like to keep these long-term monitoring sites uh, static over over the next uh, 10 years uh, but we do need to monitor changes uh, to uh, large changes to our environment but also changes to uh, decisions that are made by other partnering organizations uh, but uh, we've, we've included we've included those there because they're part of the overall uh, strategy that uh, that needs to be um, considered and and uh, brought forward at this time thanks so much Thank you. We now have direct. I have Director Kuhn, Morrison, Smith, and Acton. Director Kuhn, go ahead, please. Yeah, I went through the task of reading these reports. Now, that's a lot of reports, like 240 pages. Uh, I wonder what I'm missing is some kind of a synopsis, uh, some kind of a result as to, okay, is there actually a, a danger or, or what do we really have to watch for? I mean, you, you, you try to get it out of these reports, and um, but there are so many different informations in there. There's a lot of historical data. Um, uh, to me, it, it's almost confusing to, to read all this, this report and stuff and come to a result out of it. Uh, I don't know if, if any of you read these reports, but uh, uh, I'd like to see some kind of a synopsis. And I, I wonder if the, the consultants that did that couldn't come up with a two or three page summary and say, okay, here are the danger things and here's, and, and uh, I'd like to see that. I mean, this is this is good for specialists. Well, I, I, I am not a specialist. I mean, I, uh, uh, I understand quite a bit of stuff, but it's, it's almost confused. <laughs> it's, it almost looks like, like either staff or the consultants are trying to confuse us here because it's uh, so much information without actual results. And I'd like, I'd like to see results and then the information as a backup. So if I want to check on the results, I can go back to the report and say, okay, uh, that seems to make sense. But all this, all this data stuff there, that might be good for you guys in, 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 at, at, uh, uh, for you staff. But for us, we, we are supposed to kind of help make decisions on stuff like that well, how do you expect Mr. us to do Mr. that? Mr. Hatami, can you come in here? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Uh, just a comment here. Actually, these reports was provided by, uh, or prepared by our consultant. The first section actually is a summary, executive summary, you know, and you don't need to read all of the boring material and everything. And uh, uh, Director Ku, not necessarily every report that we put in front of the, the committee has bad news. So this one actually is, actually is not a good news, it's not a bad news, is actually informing you of the framework that we establish and we're gonna move forward. But you know, if you are uh, willing to have a kind of summary of uh, every technical report, yeah, we can do that, not a problem. Okay, yeah, I, I don't expect anything awfully sophisticated. Just, just what is your thought on what you received there? Is there anything that we have to watch for? And uh, I think that's the only thing that concerns us. I mean, all, all the nice writing in there and all the different uh, sentence structures and whatever there is, I'm not interested in all that stuff. That's, that's fine. Just give me the results. Thank you so much. Thank you. Moving, moving on now to Director Morrison, please. I recognize Director Morrison. There you are. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, uh, great comments so far. I appreciate uh, what's been said, and I too am a, uh, a big fan of executive summaries of reports, but uh, I will ha have to say that I actually drilled down pretty deep into this one because uh, it's a topic near and dear to my heart, and uh, there was some really great information in there. And and I, I want to compliment the, the authors of the report and staff for how they package this for us because this is really, as outlined by Mr. Lawrence at the beginning, this is sort of the framework. We now have the function. You know, what's the framework that we're, we're the, the skeleton that we're going to be, uh, you know, filling out and, and, and adding data to? And, and I think you've done a pretty good job with that. I... I I'm not a scientist either, but I think I understand the rationale for, for what you're, you're doing here. And, and my comments are more specific to Cowichan, but I think you've done a good job of addressing some of the other basins and, and, and the likes. But it, it's really, I think, about the fact that you're addressing, I, I'd call it a risk-based approach, really. You're, you're, most of your monitoring is going to happen in the more dense areas where there's more industrial activity, farming activity, and density and, and residential use. So I get that. And for the most part, that's going to be the east coast of Vancouver Island, specifically Cowichan Bay and, and along that coast. I, I get all of that. That makes sense. Um, I also acknowledge that we're kind of blessed in the Cowichan and, and, and the Cokes Island doesn't have this, but we have five meters of precipitation in the headwaters up uh, at the western end of my electoral area and Klaus's electoral area. Um, that's a great thing. We're, we're maybe one to one and a half meters down in, in our chairs area. So we've got that huge volume of water coming into our system and that's a really good thing. And you're gonna test and monitor for those things that are risks um, down at the end where it's all concentrated uh, near the bay and, and, and down towards the, the core areas. My question is this though, um, we often talk about the impacts to the environment, especially the riparian areas, the death by a thousand cuts. We also talk about the fact that there's 50, 60, 70 year old septic systems like literally in the riparian area that are flooded each year that are problematic. Now, because of that huge volume of precipitation each year, they're, they're really not even gonna show up in the monitoring way downstream. Probably won't even show up in the Town of Lake Couch and systems where they monitor. But it does pose an, a, a health issue and it does cause some issues for local areas up there uh, in regards to like my communities, Basachi Lake, Yuba, when you've got these, and I guess, would you call them point source pollution um, areas? Is there somewhere in this strategy, uh, like hope for, for the elected officials and community members that there's a way that we can respond or that the strategy can respond to, you know, those, those smaller outbreaks that are concerns locally in the headwaters, but may not actually even show up in the monitoring downstream. Thank you. Mr. Lawrence. So 
Thank you through the, the chair to Director Morrison. Excellent question. And uh, there's, there's a couple pieces to that. Uh, so essentially, as you've mentioned, we have what, we've, what we have and we're going forward with it at the moment is this long-term uh, monitoring program. And uh, when we do find uh, issues uh, to activate that short-term intensive uh, program that allows us to, to drill down in specific areas. Uh, at the same time, while we have that in place, uh, we continue to work with our partners. So folks like uh, the province, uh, folks like Island Health around some of these other, other pieces. So for example, uh, when we talk about septic systems, uh, they're a key partner as it relates to septic system management, uh, but also the not only linkages to those partners, but the linkages to the other programs. And so uh, when we talk about uh, liquid waste management, uh, it's it's the linkage to those, those liquid waste management plans and to have some of the policy tools brought to bear to to address those those issues uh, in a more direct way. And so uh, there's the this is really a starting point, and it's, it's important to emphasize uh, that although we have a long history of, of data uh, throughout uh, the region, uh, some of that data collection hasn't been sufficiently consistent. And so now this uh, this this tenure this uh, tenure plan uh, gives us an opportunity to collect that tenure uh, uh, data record and uh, and be able to drill down in specific areas. And I'll defer to, to uh, yes, I recognize uh, Mr. Hatami. Mr. Hatami as well, uh, may we like to, to speak to that? Thank you, I just wanna add, you know, uh, a little bit here, and uh, Director Morrison actually mentioned about uh, some kind of uh, storm or some kind of precipitation that may happen in the upper part of, you know, a watershed, and you may not see the same, you know, volume or the same intensity in, in the middle or in the um, lower part. And as uh, Keith actually mentioned, part of this program, you know, is uh, hydrometric network. And that's due to uh, the nature of climate change, we call it localized storm. Because you may actually experience some kind of high uh, intensity, short duration storm in certain part of, you know, a watershed that other parts will not experience that. So having actually that uh, network we will be more equipped with that knowledge and actually we may be able to add more monitoring stations at certain locations that we didn't know about that or it's a requirement for that. So just, I wanna add to that, that it's again, as part of a kind of larger framework, you know, water quality, water quantity, and uh, also the monitoring, you know, network, you know, and also the precipitation or rain gauges, if I call it. So that's what is missing, you know, uh, and there's a lack and there are lots of gaps in terms of having the hydrometric network. We recognize that we are working on that and it's almost, uh, we are almost done with that. We'll be ready for a presentation very soon, very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. I move on now to Director Smith, then there's Director Acton and Director Wilson to close. Go ahead, Director Smith. Uh, thank you. I have um, a couple of questions. Uh, one of the things when I was reading the Palmer report, it referred to Stocking Creek, and it indicates that the town of Ladysmith holds a license for drinking water. It, and does Saltair Water System also hold licenses? And I think it's not reflected in, in this document. So that that area provides for two different communities and that's missing. Um, I also thought that I didn't see a site for um, sort of in the lagoon area for Stocking Creek. Uh, the Stocking Creek that supplies two communities uh, when it uh, comes uh, through salt air, it goes through a farming community area that draws from the creek and have licenses, but also uh, it's a large farming area. So we do have a lot of distribution of the waste um, from the dairy farm that's there. And it's, it, is adjacent to that creek 
and as it flows down into the lagoon there's fish bearing areas through there and there's also fry in the creek when it goes through stocking creek park it's also there and so I'm and then at the end you have the shellfish harvesting that it opens up to and so I have concerns all the way along there and I'm not sure what I think it would be really important to have a monitoring site in there that would be one point I would like to make but also I would like to drill down a little bit more for organizations so how do we as directors work with people in our communities to create an organization that will be able to assist with the monitoring and have them trained and that so where where do we fit into assisting with these groups in our communities that we don't have currently I mean that's something that would be part of this package and the the other one is for staff for the development the community planning area for our MOCP the MOCP if we already have this information for Mill Bay and Cowichan Bay should we be looking at putting it into their OCPs their current OCPs and so that question would probably be for and should we move these forward earlier than our MOCP so yeah one for Keith was whether how we do what we as directors work to get groups going to assist with the monitoring and then the whether we should move the drafts into the OCPs that are current okay thank you mr. Lawrence okay thank you through the through the chair to director Smith excellent question and and really this this speaks about the opportunity to have community support and community building relationship with the community around an issue that is important to everyone so it not only allows us to to develop an opportunity to to reach and be able to bring together more resources to be able to implement the strategy but it's also an educational opportunity with the community and and the directors can play an important role and and many are already playing that role in terms of being active in the community and in those regards and so to be able to continue to to be to be champions as as they choose in watersheds in their area but we certainly look forward to to reaching out to to all folks who are interested in being a part of of the program and helping to to implement it and and hopefully we we look forward to those those opportunities so so thank you thank you moving on to miss Cheryl for you there thank you madam chair um so in in response to the question I think that we take direction from board so if you direct us in a to do to to take action with respect to water quality we will proceed in that direction we do anticipate that there'll be a report coming forward to you on the harmonized OCP in early October with in in the interest of advancing a bylaw for for potentially for first and second reading so you need to I think as a board determine whether you want to make some changes now to existing bylaws or or carry forward with the harmonized process that you set in motion and there could be a more detailed discussion about process at electoral area services committee thank you moving on now to director Acton director Nicholson I have you so we are on our one and I have three more speakers so I will go with director Acton go ahead please thank you madam chair my question is I'm I would actually first comment I would have liked to have seen some kind of communication plan even just a short plan of how we're going to be communicating out to the communities about the watershed function and where we're at where we're going right now as we all know every industry is recommending that we communicate more often right now 
so I, I would have liked to have seen that. And, and I also would like to request that some communication goes out in response to this and, and how this will help or, or inform the amount of uh, the so inform the soil bylaw to the community. There's a huge, still huge amounts of uh, soil dumping that is going on and it's causing a lot of stress in, in the south end just by the volume. So if there is some kind of um, either news, good or bad, but just some communication out to the community so that they know that we are working on the watershed function and supporting the soil bylaw through it and any kind of communication as to where we are with the soil, with the watershed function would be greatly appreciated. Okay, moving on now to Director Wilson and Director Nicholson to close. Director Wilson. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Keith, thanks, uh, thanks for this. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and I particularly want to thank you for the concise responses that you've given, because I, I appreciate we've got a limited amount of time, but the brevity and the great information, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, as far as I can see, that uh, this whole thing cannot be carried out um, comprehensively by a sole source organisation. So I, I'm going to refer to that at public input from um, uh, from Seanigan Lake, from Cliff Evans, and his final sentence says, uh, and where he's gone through everything that you've asked for, and uh, the Seanigan Basin Society is now set up and can be one of those volunteer organisations now as they have been performing most of these tasks for many years. So I'm kind of hoping that you can include those uh, bodies of volunteers which historically have been very, very instrumental in getting this forward. Thank you. Okay. Director Nicholson. Thank you. Um, this is a clearly a really important initiative. Um, I would like to, I, and I think we have time because this is not going to be implemented until 2021. Um, I would like to refer this back to staff um, to do a couple of things. One is to uh, do some consultation uh, review with planning staff and with Couch and Watershed Board and perhaps the Shawnee Basin Society, if that makes sense, um, to make sure that the strategy is going to support their work. So I, I think that needs to be really um, considered in, in, the, in the strategy. Um, also, I think that that speaks to this issue of communication and it would be good for it to come back with some uh, some uh, communication strategy attached to it. And then the other thing is, I think that the because the, the um, Couch and Bay water quality targets uh, are sort of, they kind of guide how the whole strategy um, works in part. Um, it, I think it's really important that they be reviewed um, with respect to the zoning changes that have happened very recently on the estuary. And- Mr. Um, Hatami? Updated. Mr. Hatami? Thank you. I just wanted to uh, mention something here that uh, during the, the course of, you know, a uh, consultation and developing that strategy, the Couch and Watershed Board uh, was heavily involved in that and consulted and so as, you know, the Shawnigan Basin Society, and we really appreciated, you know, their help. So they are actually in in the loop. Not only in the loop, they are partners in 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 developing that strategy. But uh, the other part that you mentioned, you know, if we can actually include that as part of the planning uh, uh, kind of exercise, and if you want to actually bring it to the modernization, that is actually a a little bit different because you know we provide you with uh, targets objectives but how you are going to implement that through uh, the land use services is up to their program and their their schedule we work with them no no doubt about it you know but again you know they have you know a number of steps you know to take before they get there and they can actually make their plan operational so that's my comment 
but uh, really, no, we we have uh, been in, uh, uh, involved, not involved, in consultation heavily with the, the two entities you mentioned, and not only them, representatives from northern uh, part of you know the watershed or upper part of the watershed, they were there. They were actually all together. They were like almost about 18 or 19 different representatives, and these two were really, really uh, helping us, you know, in, de in development of their strategy. Okay, I just, we don't even have a recommendation uh, on the floor. I'm going to uh, let uh, Director Nicholson finish your final comment, please, and I'm going to get Ms. Legault to actually read out. I, uh, please. I would like to refer this back to staff as for the reasons that I suggested before. That's a referral motion, so I'm looking for a seconder. There is no seconder. So I'm going to Ms. Legault. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The proposed recommendation is that it be recommended to the board that the regional surface water quality monitoring strategy be approved and integrated <laughs> Okay, it's been so moved. moved. Is there a seconder? Moved and seconded. Any more discussion on this recommendation? Seeing none, I call all in favor? Opposed, if any? One opposed, and Director Nicholson, the motions, the recommendation has passed. Going on now to R2. Ms. Legault. R2 is a report from the Parks and Trails Division regarding the 2020 Parks and Trails Visitation Mid-Year Tracking Summary, and this is for information. Okay, this is for information. Are there any questions for staff on this? Is uh, Mr. Farquhar in attendance? Director Acton, you have a question? I guess it's more of a comment. I, I thought it, the, the numbers were really interesting and they support what we've been uh, seeing in our communities about d during COVID of people using the parks and trails more. But uh, it would have been nice to have seen uh, the previous year to see that the growth was actually uh, COVID related. So we just weren't able to compare that, but not not a biggie. Anyway, it was, it was a really interesting report to see. That's great. And um, seeing no other hands up, oh, Director Stone and Director Morrison. Director Stone, go ahead, please. Oh, I guess, I guess maybe it was the month by month breakdown you were talking about, Director Acton, because there is the previous year here and this year shown in the report. Yeah, well, if it had the year before that, then you would see the trend of the growth. Oh, okay. Whether it was yeah. just COVID or not that caused the jump. Yeah. I got right. it. Thank you. Director Morrison? Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to uh, Mr. Farquhar, uh, just a, a quick question on the the number of these uh, uh, tracking devices and and uh, the availability. I, I know that there's seem to be a concentration in in some areas and, and lack of in others. And uh, what we might do to uh, get some of the numbers for some of the other uh, uh, other community parks. Yeah, Madam Chair, through to Director Morrison's question, uh, we have identified that uh, we would like to continue with the expansion of the program uh, as funds in annual budgets are available. And we certainly note that certainly out in the uh, Couch and Lake area, it'd be nice to have a few more strategic counters to some of the more popular parks that are used year round to get a better understanding of what that level of use is. So it definitely is in our, in our plan. Okay, we turn now to Director Smith. Go ahead, please. Director Smith, your microphone. Director Smith. It looks like her computer is frozen. Oh no, or something. Um, is there anyone else? And then I could come back to Director Smith. I'm seeing no other hands up. Director Smith, can you unmute? Okay. Am I oh, yeah, go ahead, please. Am I? I am. Uh, you're coming and going. I'm not 
not sure if you hear. No, we can't hear you. I mean, it's coming and going, and um, I'm I'm even seeing cats on the screen now. So I'm hurting cats. Sorry, Director Smith. Still can't hear you. Can you? We'll have to move along. I'm not sure what else to do. Ms. Legault? Oh, that was just for information. Seeing no, but no, seeing no other hands up. Director Smith, we'll have to. Are you there? No. Okay. I my apologies. We'll have to go now to. Um, that was for Director McGonagall. Perhaps uh, Director Smith can email her pertinent question to Mr. Farquhar for for yeah, some that's, that's what I. That's what I thought. Thank you. Um. But um, we can move on now, and um, maybe if, if that comes in, we can get it later. I'm seeing that uh, we have quite a few more reports to deal with. And we'll move on to R3. Ms. Legault. Thank you, Madam Chair. R3 is a report from Environmental Services on the CDRD Residential Retrofit and Market Acceleration Strategy for information. Are there any questions for staff? Seeing none. Oh, I have Director Morrison and Alternate Director Justice. Go ahead. And Director Kuhn. Director Morrison, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And for some reason, my um, my agenda package just failed. But I do remember the question that I had, and I guess it would be for Mr. Lawrence. So I'm, uh, I'm keenly interested in this. And part of the issue is that um, we're, we're trying to encourage people to get off of uh, fossil fuels and and so part of the issue is that uh, there's not a lot of options for people that reside in in my electoral area or or others at the lake uh, so i get that part um, i myself converted to uh to a heat pump purely electric i've just got wood for backup um got clobbered by bc hydro when they brought in the uh the two-tier um charging program and i think you'll run into that a lot but two things that I wanted to ask. Number one, uh, you're mentioning fossil fuels as a source that we're trying to get people off of in one report, but and it's not loading right now, but in another report, you include wood in the list of things that we're trying to get people off. But my understanding is that putting the air quality issue aside, wood is a renewable uh, source that people can use uh, for heating. Uh, and there's better ways to use it than, than others. So is is there a bit of a disconnect on those two items? Are we actually trying to get people to uh, convert off of wood-burning devices? And I'll, let, I'll go with that question first. Pizza can go in the oven. Pizza. So you We're need about finish them on. Just shows we're all human. Yeah. But we heard that. I have grandchildren here, so I. Who do I have? Your alternate director, Justice. No, no, I have a. Keep waiting for an answer from Mr. Lawrence, and I have a follow up. And and I was just waiting for for the chair to return, if I may, uh, Madam Chair, uh, respond to Director Morrison's question. Go ahead, please. So uh, through the chair, uh, excellent question. And uh, so, yes, when we look at uh, these programs, uh, there's a big focus within uh, the staff report that was presented on, on switching people off of fossil fuels and onto uh, renewable energy sources uh, for uh, reducing GHG emissions. Uh, at the same time, under the Airshed Protection uh, Program, uh, one of the recent changes that was made <laughs> Uh, is to uh, now uh, really focus on those incentives that, uh, that switch us uh, from, from wood to uh, electric uh, heat pumps. And so that's where the largest uh, level of incentive is. Uh, there is still uh, an incentive to have folks uh, have an upgrade uh, in, that, in their wood burning appliance to a more efficient one. 
uh, but uh, but taking out uh, the opportunity for uh, switching to uh, natural gas, so taking out that incentive uh, from wood to natural gas, but really having it focused on uh, wood to uh, electric source. So uh, that that level of synergy is needed, and uh, that's the direction that uh, these two plans uh, are working in synergy going forward. So thank you. Alternate Director Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just um, hoping for some clarification about how the CVRD retrofit program would articulate with any municipal programs. It's not clear to me whether this is for electoral areas only or whether there's potential for overlap and double dipping and that sort of thing. So. Mr. Lawrence. So through the chair uh, to the Director Justice, excellent question. Uh, there, there's so this staff report essentially presents some options for for actions uh, and and really uh, for our land use services group to have a lead role uh, in in bringing those forward, uh, including having a, a targeted incentive program that's local government based but supports those that are provincially av available as well, and the potential to work with our municipal partners on synergies. Uh, to look at those those options and one of those options could be to have it electoral area specific or one of those could be uh, as as uh, as directed uh, to have uh, those those cover uh, the broader region and so that level of decision making is something uh, that could be brought back to the board around uh, the model for an incentive program going forward uh, at the same time the the education and awareness pieces are, are really regional in nature, and there's an opportunity to, to leverage those materials from the province and uh, and uh, that are developed uh, within uh, the, the regional district for, for all municipal members uh, going forward. And so uh, there's a number of considerations there, but uh, certainly opportunities for, for synergy uh, within the region and with our municipal partners here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Director Kuhn. Okay, um, I wanted to just go back to Director Smith Oh, Director Nicholson, I just going to check in with Director Smith. Is everything okay with your computer now? Um, I logged out, logged back in. Um, okay, so do you, it, can we go back to your, do you want to, no? Okay, go ahead, Director Nicholson. Thank you. So if, when I, when I read this report, I was thinking that, um, it really spoke to the fact that regional districts don't have a lot of tools for dealing with this kind of thing. So if we were going to, if we wanted to have an incentive program, um, how would we need a new service function to pay for that or how would that work? Mr. Lawrence. And so, so yes, good question uh, through the chair to uh, Director Nicholson. Uh, one of the pieces that would be explored, and we've already started uh, some of those uh, discussions uh, with, with finance around uh, what are the potential uh, functions and, and tools that could be used to, uh, to support an incentive program. Uh, of course, that depends on whether it is uh, regional in nature or electoral area specific and, and the type of function that that would, uh, that, that would, that, that would come about for that. Uh, but also um, uh, recognizing uh, the role of our land use services department in this going forward. And so uh, working uh, through our land use services department on the next steps of this, this program and identifying a, a suitable function. So, um, and I'll, I'll defer to uh, uh, Dr. Hatami if there's any other uh, comments on that as well, other than what I've mentioned already. Yeah. Thank you. Basically, at this point, you know, this is a sort of a strategy. And uh, again, it needs, you know, lots of other, um, I, I call it steps, how we are going to incorporate that into our kind of uh, land development and uh, the, 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 the permit that we issue. And this is going to be an incentive. Maybe we need a having a, a framework for that if a new de uh, developer wanted to do that, or is an existing homeowner wanted to retrofit, what kind of incentives and what actually kind of tools we have in our toolbox? Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, as part of the engineering uh, department, we're gonna work with planning department to come up with that things. But at this point, I don't know. I mean, I don't have any, um, 
kind of way to do that. Maybe part of the modernization, how we are going to uh, deal with the climate change and reduce the GHG. Uh, so yes, you know, it's, it's possible. I can see that. But uh, right now, I don't, I, I cannot answer that question. Follow up, Dr. Nicholson. Microphone, then Dr. Nicholson, and we'll go to Director Smith and then Director Morrison. Director Smith, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the things is we have uh, quite a few different programs under the federal and under the provincial government for these uh, uh, incentives, and those are already funded by taxpayers. Uh, we would then bring a retrofit into the CVRD that would be funded by taxpayers, and not all taxpayers would be receiving the benefit. Uh, that might be a concern to uh, the taxpayers in the area. And um, the cost of staff time and the staff capacity, I'm wondering how that would fit into something like this. Thank you. Who would like to address this, Mr. Hotami or Mr. Lawrence? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. At this point, I don't know. I mean, these are the very detailed, you know, um, Kind of, of the of the plan, but uh, as I said, this is a strategy. In order to bring the strategy to the level, the detail that we are talking about, it takes some time. You know, we have to go through the tactical and then programs and projects. And uh, at, at this at this point, it's very difficult for me to have a uh, kind of answer to to those questions. I turn now to Director Morrison to close. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief. I, I think this is something that needs to be explored. Uh, I will, some of you have heard me uh, and were around when we tried to design a, uh, a low income, high impact uh, wood stove exchange program for, uh, for people that had really old and inefficient stoves, but didn't have the uh, financial wherewithal to, uh, make a large contribution to the program. And uh, I think we had a design where we could have taken 18 really old smoker stoves out of the system. And uh, it would have been highly subsidized through the various different programs and, and the taxpayers of the CBRD. And uh, at the very last minute, the uh, CBRD contribution to the program was, uh, was halved, which meant that somebody would have had to have gone from uh, a two or three hundred dollar investment to a six or seven hundred dollar investment and uh, it would have made double the amount of of uh, rebates and retrofits available but as it turned out because it it was just that much beyond the reach of of low-income people with old inefficient stoves we had zero uptake on the higher cost program so i you know just at, at this level i think that there's, these programs are available to our municipal partners. I would like to know what the electoral area director's interests would be in, uh, in looking at this and, and creating an electoral area initiative around this and whether or not we might want to uh, just have this information item come to electoral areas, uh, the electoral area services committee. So I would just put that out there and, and if there is interest, we could talk afterwards and it could be arranged to be uh, to brought to that committee. It sounds good. Actually, I would like to see that. Um, so I'm seeing no other hands up. We're moving on now to our, no, that was for information, R4, Ms. Legault. Thank you, Madam Chair. R4 is a report from Environmental Services Division regarding Shawnigan Lake flood mapping, and Mr. Lawrence has some introductory comments. Go ahead, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, now sharing uh, the screen for uh, the, the next presentation here, which is uh, for the staff report for the Shawnigan Lake flood monitoring and uh, mapping project. And so uh, we'll be talking about uh, climate adaptation today, uh, but uh, the, the Shawnigan Lake flood monitoring and mapping project uh, is uh, a large component of the, the overall climate adaptation uh, strategy. 
and uh, it fits in with the phase two of that strategy. So the, the development of risk assessments and uh, information to support our understanding of risk uh, as it relates to climate impacts. And so uh, the, uh, the need and the responsibility for, for understanding the risks of flood uh, is clearly articulated by the province uh, that uh, the local governments uh, need to take that responsibility for, for developing that understanding. And so uh, essentially uh, the, the development of flood mapping is uh, an important first step towards uh, reducing uh, the, the impacts of flood uh, within our communities. And, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through uh, the, the, the brief introduction here today. Uh, but essentially recognizing that funding for this project uh, was provided by senior levels of government through the National Disaster Mitigation Program, so from the province and the federal government to, to do this work, and we were fortunate enough to be awarded the grant uh, for this project. Uh, it also fits in alongside several other risk assessment and mapping projects that are underway or were recently completed. So those recently completed ones include uh, the sea level rise risk assessment, uh, the floodplain risk assessment uh, of floodplains in the region, uh, the Cowichan Lake geohazard uh, risk assessment, uh, the development of a busy place stormwater management plan, uh, so, uh, and then also the watersheds risk analysis, uh, and all of these have been uh, brought forward to, to the board. Uh, we also have a number of others which are in progress and uh, will be coming as well to, to committee, and I'll, I'll talk uh, a bit about that uh, in, in the moments to come. Uh, essentially, uh, this project, the, the Shawnigan Lake flood mapping project, uh, the two key outcomes here were to prepare updated flood mapping, uh, and that is essentially to support land use decisions uh, and also inform the public about uh, the potential threats of flooding. Uh, the next outcome uh, was to install lake level monitoring station uh, and est establish a flood warning system to improve flood response, and that station uh, was installed uh, at the Decca Road uh, water intake uh, uh, for the, uh, the Shawnigan Beach Estates uh, water system. Uh, and it gives us that ability to, uh, to, to, to have that flood warning system in place. Four key tasks within the project uh, included a survey of Shawnigan Creek outlet to identify uh, the topography uh, in that area, but also identify high water marks, uh, which uh, help us with the understanding of uh, the, the flood conditions uh, historically, uh, but also what we can expect going forward. Uh, next key task was to install that water level monitoring station, uh, again at Decca Road, but we also had one installed uh, temporarily at the Weir so that we could do some correlation of water levels between those two uh, locations. The next task was to uh, develop uh, hydrologic analysis. So based on that uh, water level data that was gathered at those, those two locations, uh, as well as a look at historical water level data, a look at the climate projections for rainfall and inflow to the lake, uh, considering a potential 20% uh, increase in inflow due to climate projections, uh, and a look at uh, historic flood events in the, in the watershed. Uh, the next uh, task uh, was to, to take that hydrologic analysis and, uh, and, and build the, uh, the floodplain mapping uh, and uh, they, that floodplain mapping is based on the 200-year the uh, return flood conditions, and we'll talk about that briefly in a moment. But, uh, but first, uh, uh, important to consider the, the history of flooding within the Shawnigan Lake uh, area, and uh, goes back to uh, one uh, particular event uh, that was quite significant in 1935, and there's some, some images here of of uh, those locations, and the one on the bottom right is is down along near the the area of, of Mason's Beach, and uh, what we saw there, and, and, and that event was in the order of a, a one in hundred year flood event, and uh, uh, the lake levels uh, also uh, were were high during uh, 1972 and a 1979 events. Uh, and then, uh, for, for reference for folks, the, the event that we saw in February 2020 of this year was in the order of a 1 in 10 to 1 in uh, 20 uh, year uh, return period. So the type of flood that we would expect to occur uh, every, every 10 to, to 20 years historically. And so uh, we, 
we were able to uh, to do some some updated mapping though through this project because uh, we have uh, updated uh, lidar and that's this lidar data is is essentially uh, this um, this uh, series of data that's gathered from a laser uh, directed towards the surface of the ground which uh, returns uh, uh, a signal and allows us to determine uh, diff differentials in the, the topography, uh, essentially the elevation of the land uh, a around the, the lake shore perimeter. And so uh, what we were working with uh, before this project, uh, as you can see, uh, is this 1979 flood map that was developed by the province. And uh, it, it, the, the challenge with this map, as, as you can see, is that there's a that faint dotted line if, if you can make it out and, and, and uh, it's quite understandable if you can't because that's one of the challenges is the poor resolution of, of the map and uh, that it uh, really doesn't allow us to, to support uh, planning uh, purposes and decision making uh, and communication to the, the public about, uh, about flood risks. Uh, it was based on a lake level of, uh, of a, fl a flood construction level rather of 119.4 meters. And I'll just keep that number in mind as we go forward to the next slide. But that 119.4 meters uh, is roughly uh, the same as what we saw during that 1935 uh, flood event. And uh, also understanding that with this old map, there was no information on the methods or the data that was used to, to make this assessment uh, back in the 1970s. So now we turn to what we were able to produce with our consultants, uh, NHC consultants, uh, through this project. And uh, essentially, uh, this, this map, uh, this flood map, shows uh, one snapshot of a series of four maps that make up the, the updated Shawnigan Lake uh, floodplain mapping. And it's based on uh, a flood construction level of 119.94 uh, to uh, a, a lake level of 120.14. Uh, so a flood construction level rather of 119.94 to uh, 120.14. And, and that higher level uh, is, uh, is for those areas that are more exposed to, to wave run up. So uh, if you look around the area of of Decker Road and uh, Worthington Road at the, the north end of the lake uh, in, along that point that's exposed to uh, the south uh, the, 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 the south direction of the lake and those opportunities for, for waves to build up. And, um, and so that's why we have that, uh, that increase in the flood construction level of, uh, of 120.14 uh, versus uh, other areas which are more uh, sheltered from the, the impacts of, of wave run up. And so this again illustrates a one in 200 year flood event. That's the uh, event that we could expect to happen every 200 years. And so a way of looking that, at that is uh, there's a 0.5% chance that in any given year that that, uh, that event could happen, this event. Uh, but when we look at that over the course of say 70 years, which is the lifespan of a, of a home, uh, the percentage of it happening is actually a lot higher. It's in the order of, of 30%. And so uh, some, some consideration there for, for folks as we consider uh, this 200-year this uh, return period. And so uh, again, uh, uh, was, we we're fortunate enough to have the, the, the funding to be able to produce a map which uh, gives us uh, a much greater ability to, to now uh, communicate uh, flood impacts but also um, uh, support uh, land use decisions in the, in the Shawnigan uh, Basin area. We've included a few images uh, such as these in the, the report, and uh, they help illustrate uh, what that 200 year flood condition could look like, uh, that red line uh, that we see in these, these images. And uh, really that red line, uh, please keep in mind that that's in relation to where uh, the technician in the photo is, is standing uh, and, and, and it really only applies to that specific location, uh, but some illustrative examples of, of locations that may be familiar to folks around, uh, around Shawnigan Lake. So the next steps in the process uh, and uh, most importantly is to, to go and replace the out-of-date uh, flood maps uh, that are on the CVRD website and start using them to inform uh, the future uh, flood management, potential, a potential future flood management bylaw 
but also to inform uh, building permits going forward. Uh, the review of, of floodplain maps should be done about every 10 years, uh, but also with consideration to any uh, uh, extreme flood events that might happen between now and the next uh, 10 years, uh, and uh, look at the opportunity to, to do updating, updated flood mapping at that time. Uh, but also if more accurate data becomes available uh, that will allow us to, to refine these, these, uh, the, the, this mapping uh, product that we have to, to then go and uh, one of the key steps now is to specify the lake levels uh, that the flood warning notification should be sent uh, to, to key staff members uh, that can ultimately uh, support uh, the awareness to, to folks, uh, the public, uh, about um, what, uh, what response should be taken uh, in re it, to address that, uh, that rising lake level and the potential for, for flood conditions. Uh, and also key to this is to maintain and communicate uh, the flood warning system to the area residents uh, and uh, to, to uh, also continue to engage with our uh, Shawnigan Weir operation uh, group uh, to incorporate uh, the results into, into their work. Uh, and uh, be able to take uh, this updated information uh, and communicate it to, to applicants for, uh, for, for building permits and uh, development permits uh, so that they have that in hand uh, as they go forward with those, those processes. And with that, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present and glad to uh, have any questions on that. Thank you so much. Uh, if you could take down your screen, I could see my colleagues. Thank you. Okay, and we also have a recommendation as well. So Director McGonigal and then Director Acton. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Just for clarification, I'm not quite familiar with the Shawnigan Weir operation and who the entity and the jurisdiction that resides under. Just, just for uh, information, uh, if you would. Mr. Lawrence. Thank you, through the Chair to Director McGonigal. Uh, the, the so there's the three groups that operate the Shawnigan Weir are the, the CBRD and our utilities group, uh, the folks that sit at the table for those discussions. Uh, the other two entities are Mill Bay Waterworks and the Shawnigan uh, Village Water System. Thank you. Director Acton, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, my question again is uh, how could we be if we're not already planning on this, but it would be nice to have this communicated out to the community. Um, it was a pretty clear report, but obviously we don't need to, to put it in as much detail as Klaus said, but uh, some, a report that it's, it's happened and that it's available and where to find it. So something that, uh, and then on the long term, where can we find that report as well? Is this gonna be easy, easily accessible on the CBRD website? I know there's a lot of people who would be interested in referring to it. Mr. Lawrence. So uh, through the chair to Director Acton, uh, yes, this, uh, following this, this uh, meeting and the, um, the submission of this report, uh, we will be able to go forward and post this on our website and it'll go into that uh, location where we have a number of these other uh, hazard uh, and uh, risk assessment based uh, reports, but uh, also in other key locations where uh, it links to land use decision making as well as uh, the broader uh, climate adaptation pieces. So uh, to be able to have it accessible in a number of different places for folks um, and uh, have that have that available. We're also working on a sign, uh, a poster. Essentially, it looks like a poster, but have it as a sign uh, with a graphic designer that uh, essentially shows the the flood map, uh, and uh, would have that uh, uh, potentially working with um, with parks around having something posted so that folks can can look at that. And, and then the communication piece. Will we be doing the you know, typical things like a uh, a newspaper, uh, a news release, and uh, some social media work, just to start letting the community know that this is something we've worked on, and and um, you know, something that's being taken seriously. Mr. Lawrence. Uh, so again, through the chair to Director Acton. Uh, 
Yes, yeah, so we will be be working together as, as staff in terms of <laughs> deploying that uh, that communication piece around this uh, this new piece of work and uh, using the tools that we have, uh, as you mentioned, and considering all of those options for 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 getting the message out that we have this this new piece of work and and uh, and making sure that it's accessible to to all of those folks. Great. So we have a recommendation. I'd like to move the recommendation. Okay, we'll have I'd like it. To oh. Move the recommendation, Madam Chair. Okay. Yeah, we'll just have it read, Ms. Legault. It's, so it's been moved, but we would like to hear it and we'll get a seconder. Thank you, Madam Chair, that it be recommended to the board that the updated Shawnigan Lake flood maps and supporting technical report and recommendations be adopted. It's been seconded. I'm going to call the question. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Motion's carried. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to remind our audience that if they have any questions to the chair, it's legislative services dot at cvrd.bc.ca if they have any questions um, at the end. And we have one more report. Go ahead, Ms. Legault. Thank you, Madam Chair. A report from the Environmental Services Division regarding CVRD climate change adaptation strategy. Is this the Mr. Lawrence show or what? Wow. Welcome. Okay, go again. You're on. Thank you, Madam Chair. And if, if I may, I will share my screen one more time here and bring up our uh, uh, presentation for the climate adaptation strategy. And again, uh, a brief uh, introduction to the staff report and the work that has been underway in this area. Uh, so again, essentially this is the staff report uh, is, is for information purposes to provide an update to directors on the progress towards the climate change uh, adaptation strategy. Uh, and uh, to begin with, uh, just a little bit of, of history around uh, the, the strategic direction. Uh, it was in 2014, to, in the 2014 to 2018 strategic uh, plan that the board prioritized the establishment of a climate change adaptation strategy. And uh, one of, as components to this strategy uh, have been completed, as we've been completing those, we've been bringing those forward to, uh, to committee and to the board. Uh, so for example, the projections, the risk assessments, uh, and now some progress on the, the actual strategy. And so the, what we're providing as part of this uh, staff report is the framework of that strategy. Uh, we're still working on uh, finalizing and fine tuning the actions with uh, with the input of, of key partners throughout the region. So, and so with that, uh, a, a brief refresher on on the overall program, uh, which we frame as New Normal Cowichan, and it's this multi-phased program to to address climate uh, climate impacts. And essentially, uh, the plan uh, takes this risk-based approach of looking at where are the our highest areas of of impact within the community and within the region. Uh, and look at uh, the appropriate actions, whether they be policy related or infrastructure related or uh, emergency planning related uh, to be able to, to move forward on those. And so uh, in, in 2017, we had the opportunity to go forward uh, and develop the phase one uh, climate uh, projections, uh, which essentially took uh, these large national and global data sets and gave us uh, Cowichan Valley region specific climate projections. We've had that chance to work with uh, PCIC, the climate, Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium, uh, to develop these projections and um, acknowledgement to uh, the, the, the hard work of, of several team members uh, within the group for uh, uh, putting these, these projections uh, together. Uh, but uh, essentially, uh, those projections uh, gave us uh, an understanding of the expectations that we can have. Uh, for the future, going out to the 2050 and 2080 uh, timeframes. Uh, understanding uh, uh, indicators such as um, that we can, we can expect this uh, warming trend to continue and, and for example, to have um, uh, a doubling in the number of days over 25 degrees Celsius by 2050 and a tripling by, by 2080. Uh, but also uh, the understanding that we can expect uh, to overall have um, an increase in annual precipitation, uh, but those patterns will change over time, that we will have uh, drier summers than we already have, um, we'll have wetter winters and falls than, than we already have, um, and, and then our, our storm intensities, uh, those, those rainfall events, uh, will, 
will increase in intensity uh, out to those 2050 and, and 2080 timeframes, all the while uh, recognizing that there's a need to understand uh, what the, the impacts of those projections are. And that speaks uh, in a big way to the next phase of work, which was the risk assessments uh, that were completed uh, and, and also underway. And so uh, some of those key risk assessments, uh, as mentioned uh, previously, uh, included coastal sea level rise, but also um, geohazard uh, risk assessment around Cowichan Lake, uh, floodplain risk assessment around some of the key floodplains. Uh, we're also, for, for folks, um, information continued to work on uh, uh, the updated flood mapping for the Cowichan Cooksila flood uh, plain area. Uh, and expect that to, to come through uh, later this year, um, bringing forward that to, to committee. Um, we're also working on updated flood mapping for the river bottom area, uh, which is mostly complete and expected to come back to uh, an upcoming uh, regional services committee meeting. We're also conducting, uh, in addition to what we have here, uh, uh, going to be conducting a uh, marine shoreline stability assessment in the Saltaire area and some of the key areas there uh, to understand uh, what uh, what the risks and impacts are, as well as taking some of the uh, the uh, approach that we had uh, done in the Cowichan Lake area for geohazards and applying that uh, regionally uh, so we can understand uh, geohazards, uh, slope failures and rockfall uh, across the region and understand where some, some priority areas are that, that need to be addressed. And so uh, these these uh, risk assessments, again, uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to move forward on these uh, with the support of the NDMP funding from the, the senior levels of, of government. And all of that uh, leads up to where we are, uh, one of the key pieces work we're working on right now, which is this phase three climate adaptation strategy uh, development. And with the input of, of numerous partners uh, and um, and folks in the community ranging from uh, uh, high school students as well as folks from the school district uh, to our agencies that are active in this area such as Island Health and provincial agencies as well as um, our climate stewards uh, that are working in this area um, as well as uh, our municipal partners and First Nations around um, building a vision and goals, uh, objectives and actions. And so essentially the vision of the strategy is that the CVRD and its community partners will take a proactive approach to prepare the social, economic and environmental systems to the impacts of a changing climate. And there, within that, there are five goals uh, that relate to um, building on um, a lot of the, the work that's already in place around climate adaptation and uh, extreme weather preparedness, uh, but uh, also increasing the resilience of our uh, infrastructure and programs uh, to be able to respond to a changing climate, um, protecting the health uh, of, of residents, uh, and in particular, uh, our vulnerable populations. Uh, also looking at how we protect and, and enhance uh, terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem health and all the while uh, improving the awareness and knowledge of the, uh, the, the skills and resources that are available uh, to help our communities build resilience and adapt to our changing climate. Those, um, those goals, within, within those goals, uh, each of those lines up with uh, impact areas and objectives which are outlined in the, the strategy framework document that was attached to this uh, staff report. Uh, essentially, uh, the, the, um, the, these impact uh, areas and uh, are surrounding are really revolve around six key uh, areas. One is uh, around ecosystems and biodiversity, where we uh, have a chance to look at uh, the impacts on uh, our estuaries from, from sea level rise, uh, the impacts on um, uh, that come about from uh, the increase in invasive species coming into our region. Uh, we also have uh, an action area around watershed and groundwater health, which has some significant overlap with the drinking water and watershed protection program. Uh, but uh, those pieces need to talk to each other so that we're ensuring that we uh, recognize the, um, the changes in water supply that we can expect to, to come in, in, in years to come, both groundwater and surface water 
uh, as well as potentially the increase in, in demand for, for water. The, uh, the, the health and well-being of, of folks within our community uh, is an area where there's um, some, some key uh, opportunities for collaboration with Island Health and working with them around uh, not only the, the impact to, uh, to long-term health, uh, such as uh, those from, from air quality, uh, but also uh, working with um, our public safety group around emergency preparedness uh, so that we can protect uh, public, public safety and, and uh, the health of folks within our region. Uh, infrastructure, there's an area there and, and there's, uh, we've had significant uh, input from uh, utilities folks uh, across uh, not only the CBRD but with municipal partners around how we build uh, resilient uh, infrastructure. Uh, both green infrastructure and uh, those uh, those hardened infrastructure features that uh, we depend uh, we depend upon economic development um, not only uh, talking about tourism here but other uh, big pieces that are important to our economy including forestry uh, as well as agriculture and uh, supporting those programs and strategies uh, that are already in place uh, and making sure that they talk to each other uh, that there's synergy between the climate piece and those those pieces that are already in place. Uh, Bioregional carrying capacity really speaks about uh, us developing uh, that uh, understanding of, of how what is what is our land base capable of of supporting and, and understanding uh, as we have a growing region uh, what are the what are the impacts going forward uh, based on climate and uh, where are the opportunities uh, for our communities to develop in the future? Enabling actions uh, really talk about the opportunity to to build capacity uh, to within our our, our, our region uh, across the various collaborators to uh, to to bring together uh, a greater sense of of response uh, cumulatively uh, to to an, an issue that is that is incredibly large uh, and and widespread throughout. Uh, all of our sectors, uh, but all our um, various uh, communities within the region. Especially the next steps for completing the strategy are to um, have uh, some, some final workshops with partnering organizations uh, in the summer, and, and through those finalizing the actions and the supporting actions uh, that uh, are within the strategy, and really focusing on those that have an opportunity to be CBRD-led actions. August and uh, September uh, 2020, uh, finalizing this, the strategy uh, early this fall and, uh, and then having a more detailed implementation plan based on that strategy uh, for later this fall in November uh, and coming back uh, to present that strategy to uh, this committee uh, with the implementation plan by the end of this year. And that's uh, essentially uh, an overview of the progress so far on the strategy and uh, the strategy framework thus far. So uh, if there are any questions, glad to respond to those as, as they may be. Thank you so much, Mr. Lawrence. I see this is for information. Um, I look to my colleagues if there are any questions and I see there are a few. I have uh, alternate director justice. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, through you to Mr. Lawrence. Um, so climate action plans are being developed at all sorts of levels, federal, provincial, regional, municipal. Um, you've said that the future, immediate future is working with key partners to, I guess, refine and fill out this framework. Can you say a bit more about who those key partners will be and, and actually how that how that works going to progress. And in particular, um, could you describe your working relationship with any environmental specialists in uh, either couch and municipalities um, working on similar plans? Lawrence? Okay, through the chair uh, to Director Justice, thank you for, for that question uh, and uh, that's uh, an excellent piece there around the need for, for collaboration. And we have um, been working since the beginning with a number of groups. And I'll start with 
our municipal partners because um, the the opportunities for synergy are are tremendous there, uh, uh, and uh, not only are they working on uh, strategies and action plans, uh, but we have other programs in in place as well. And so it's being able to uh, learn from each other, uh, develop synergies, and overall have a stronger uh, response to to climate. And uh, in particular, working with the environmental uh, technicians and specialists and leading up to uh, the development of the framework uh, and uh, even uh, the, the development of the, the actions and the refinement of actions, we've had some, some, some tremendous input from folks uh, and engagement from uh, our municipal partners to be able, at that staff level, to be able to, to refine the actions uh, and uh, be able to uh, ensure that we're, we're efficient with our strategy to be able to, to avoid those redundancies uh, and uh, be able to, to co-leverage resources, tools, uh, learnings from each other. Uh, at, the, at those higher levels of government, uh, we've had those uh, opportunities as well to work with provincial agencies. Um, again, uh, some of those include uh, Island Health, uh, our provincial agencies at the Ministry of Environment, uh, Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations as well, uh, working with uh, our forest uh, sector, uh, Mosaic Forests, uh, working with um, our, our various utility operators uh, for water and sewer systems, and our First Nations partners uh, as well, uh, being able to, uh, and that's it, tremendously important that we're able to bring forward uh, the knowledge that they have around impacts uh, and and how we can address these these going forward. Um, again, uh, had an opportunity to gather input from from high school students from the the public uh, high school system as well as some elementary school students that uh, were fortunate enough to attend our workshops. Uh, input from from directors uh, through the workshops, and uh, even I'll, I'll speak most uh, recently to uh, some of the, the pieces that are happening at the provincial level uh, very briefly as well, uh, that they are coming through with uh, a higher level strategy uh, that uh, is expected to be uh, released this fall. And it will include uh, additional tools uh, for, and this is their intent, that it will include uh, additional forums for local governments to collaborate, not only uh, within their regions, but uh, with neighboring regions, uh, as well as uh, information uh, and uh, tools for resources uh, for communicating impacts and uh, uh, providing that level of education and awareness to to folks around uh, how they can respond. And so, uh, there's so where there's synergies to be uh, to be had. Uh, the intent uh, is that there's some support out there from from the province. Uh, as well, and we're looking forward to to seeing the the outcome of that uh, later this year. Thanks. I I have a speakers list. Director Wilson, is it McGonagall? Who have I missed anyone? Not McGonagall. So I have direct. Yes, Director Kuhn and Director Wilson and Director Wilson. Go ahead, please. This is for information, and it's now one o'clock. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Keith, the um, climate projections I think you mentioned were based on 2017 data. Um, has there been any update on that, considering that was three years ago, or have the projections been updated as you get new data? Mr. Lawrence. Uh, through the Chair, the those projections are the ones that we're using for the work right now. Uh, as data is uh, more, more accurate data is available nationally and globally, um, we work with the, the province and, and PKIC to monitor that, uh, to be able to, to update those uh, when, when more accurate data becomes available, but that's what we're working with right now. So, so thank you. Director Kuhn, did you have a question? I just have a comment. Um, Climate change uh, can be really emotionally charged, <clears throat> and um, I'm concerned uh, any presentations that we make to the public at e and even at, at board meetings, uh, uh, we, we should be very careful 
uh, not to, let's say, overemphasize some of the uh, uh, possible uh, scenarios that could arise. We don't want to have anything like uh, like what happened in Yubo happen uh, on a greater scale. Uh, it, it was quite embarrassing. And I, I'd like to just one make make one comment to the chair. Would it be possible in the future to to limit comments by staff as well as by some of the directors because some some of the speeches go on and on and on and and we constantly seem to be running out of time. Uh, so maybe we should keep that in in uh, in view for for the next meetings. Thank you. I can tell you're hungry, Director Coon. Yes, I am. I'm getting That's answered. Fine. Okay. Well, we are at our last, so um, I'm seeing. No, no more hands up. And that was for information. I go now to Ms. Legault. We don't have any new business. We have one submission for question period. Okay, so we go straight to question period. Go ahead, please. Uh, this uh, submission is from Cliff Evans. Madam Chair, can the CVRD set up a red flag water problem system so land use decisions can be curtailed in these areas until these problem areas are rectified? Example, the soil deposit bylaws. Why swamp an area with soil deposit sites when the area is already suffering under severe water problems? Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Evans. I think we are working on that and we do all have concerns and doing our best with that. Madam Chair, I've just received a second submission uh, from Bernard Yearlink. Dear Chair, what measures are being made to ensure that, uh, that staff in making their recommendations are recommendations in compliance with the Climate Strategy Initiative? Uh, I think they're making those. They're working, they're working together. We heard that they were all working together, so I, I felt that um, it was very promising. There are no further submissions for question period. Thank you so much. So we're at call motion to adjourn. It's been moved and seconded. Moved. All, in, all in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you so much.